Baldwin movie, because or the Alec Baldwin uh, interrogation. Now, if you're not familiar with what happened here, and hopefully this comes up as uh, I'm just waiting for it to come up. Uh, oh, so if you don't know what happened here, uh, Alec Baldwin was handling a firearm on the scene of the movie Rust, and that firearm went off. It, okay. So I have no idea why this came up uh, midway through my discussion, but we'll all do a little bit of a uh, <laughs> sort of recap here. Uh, it'll probably have all of that on the replay later, but uh, hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. Uh, I just wanted to discuss the, uh, the Alec Baldwin interrogation, and some people have said interview. It's kind of... Uh, Interview and interrogation are kind of police language, and you have to always be careful not to not to sort of fall in with uh, not to fall in with the kind of inherent deception to it. Now, um, if you're not familiar with what happened, Alec Baldwin was filming the movie Rust and was handling a firearm uh, that was a Pieta uh, single action army clone. And that firearm went off, and there's some discussion about how that happened. I'm probably going to do a video at some point uh, with a single action army clone to talk about those details. I know some other people have done similar things, but uh, I have some uh, some takes on it and something unique to bring to it. So, but this interrogation is like seven months old. It's been uh, out for a while and I've just been meaning to cover it and such is life. Uh, so this is not breaking news at this point. However, uh, I kind of like going through interrogations because uh, you see a lot of them doing criminal defense and there's always kind of different dimensions, but there's a lot of similarities. Now, I've only watched a little bit of this one. I watched the first like five minutes and then I said, I think I'll probably catch this and do it uh, live. I actually watched the first like five minutes on Rakeda's stream, Nick Rakeda's stream. So uh, yeah, uh, this one is a weird one in terms of what's happening. So I thought I would uh, check that out. Somebody's asking, is it getting late for me? It is about 8 p.m. where I am. So let's... Uh, bring this up here and we'll have a look. So, all right. So the first thing I'm going to mention before we get anywhere into this is that uh, what we're looking at here is a bit of a, a different thing here than usual. And can you guys not see the actual video? This is irksome. I can see it on my end, but I can't see it where you guys are. There it is. I just had to hit play a little bit. All right. So this interview room uh, is not sort of, it's not what we'd call sort of the hard interview room. This is not exactly the soft interview room either. This is kind of some sort of intermediate space here. Because what I mean by a hard interview room, often when you look at these things, they're in a very cramped space and they're in a, uh, a very confined space. And there's a very sort of particular layout that they use almost all the time. And that's for when you're sort of there as a, an immediate suspect and they want to make you feel uncomfortable. Now, they also have some softer rooms that are designed for, uh, like, for when they're interviewing vulnerable uh, complainants. This is sort of something in the medium. Uh, but this is clearly an, in, an interrogation room. You can see they've got the... Uh, you know, the acoustic foam up, the recording devices on this are fantastic. So this is, um, yeah, this is kind of uh, an interesting thing. Somebody says, have I ever been with clients in the interview room? Yes. Uh, however, in Canada, they don't actually allow you to be in the interview room for, uh, for most people. Uh, however, with young offenders, then you can. And I will tell you that typically... Uh, that tends to shut down the uh, the interview fairly quickly. So that's uh, that's sort of how that uh, tends to work. And somebody says, will I eventually be viewing all of the interviews and interrogations? I'm kind of tempted to, but I will have to look. I also want to see... Uh, 
Uh, I also want to try to do some more Canadian uh, inter interrogations. So I'm going to be looking at trying to uh, try to do this. And I see somebody noting, never, ever go into that room without a lawyer in the USA. Never speak in that room without a lawyer. Uh, yeah. In the US, you know, make sure you call a lawyer. And I think that they will show up to help you out in this room. And yeah, in Canada, unfortunately, all you can get is you can talk to somebody like me who will then give you directions as to what you should do in the room. But you've got to handle it on your own. Uh, somebody saying, how's the pup? Um, he's a lot more mobile right now, but, uh, he's still having a rough time of things, but, uh, all right, let's, uh, let's keep going here. Um, either of those I thought he was coming with you, so, um, yes, not. Um, I'm Alex, I'm a detective on the case, and can we get you coffee or anything? Okay, we'll be in here in just a minute, okay? Now, they often offer people, you know, water or, you know, cola or other things. Sometimes they'll actually go so far as to offer people, uh, you know, food and so forth. That's not because they like you. That's that's a tactic to get you talking. Uh, if you think about it, when you, you know, we tend to feel a need to reciprocate when people do nice things for you. And it tends to put us at ease. So this offer of food and so forth is not uh, is not uh, for the you know for the benefit of the person there. Now, uh, quite often you'll see people upset in the media, that, especially when there's people who've committed some heinous crime, and they'll go, "Oh, and they bought this person McDonald's or whatever." It's like, well, yeah, they did because they want them to talk. They want to get them to uh, to confess. Uh, the other thing is that any time they hand you something. Uh, you've got to be careful with what you do with it, because if they give you that water bottle, well, uh, you're going to put your mouth on that. You're going to put your hands on that. You're and, you know, you chuck that in the trash. Well, nothing stops the cops from digging that back out of the garbage afterwards. So that's always uh, always something to be uh, concerned about, potentially. Somebody says, how come you haven't been following the RCMP scandal? I plan to do some more coverage on that, but uh I'm just trying to uh, sort of uh, trying to cover a variety of things here. All right, so let's uh, let's keep going. Now this is also really weird to me that he's got a phone in there. Uh, usually when you uh, usually when you end up in this room, they'll have you uh, they'll try to take that stuff away from you because they don't want you having a phone. They don't want you being able to do exactly what he's about to do here. Um, that said, what he's about to do is is dumb. Um, yes, quite possibly, because uh, that's that's a good one to cover for sure. So right now he's messing around on his phone. He's playing around on some sort of app or possibly texting. But now he's calling. And this is weird. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm at the police station, the sheriffs, and they're about to interview me. Um, how is everyone at home? How are the kids? The kids are great. The kids are great. Did you um, tell, did you, hold on a second, please. Did you tell Carmen what's going on? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, are you convinced you don't want to come tomorrow? I mean, I don't think it's a good idea. Look, look, call me after you talk with the sheriff, but, like, I don't think it's a great idea. I think, I think, I think this is, you know. No, let me just, let me just say this to you, just, be clear, just to be clear. They're going to make me stay here tomorrow anyway talk to my insurance investigators. This is really, I mean, I'll talk to you more, but I'm just saying. I'm so sorry, you must have such, like, you must be so charming. No, 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 what I am is someone who, I don't want to do this for anymore, I don't. I don't want to be a public person. 
and you know I'm the one holding the gun in my hand that everybody was supposed to have taken care of. They always hand me a cold gun. Where, where are you now? So he's already made some admissions here that uh, I would not want him to have made. You know, I was the one holding the gun in my hand. That's a great thing to admit. Um, now, I also just want to let just pay attention a little bit here as we go, just to the quality of the sound. Because, I mean, we're getting some weird sort of uh, background noise as well. But you can hear him really well, right? You can hear him really crystal clear. And he's taking it off speaker. So let's just see here. Michelle, who? And where are you? Now, you hear how you can actually pick up her voice. And I'm not going to go back and have it... Uh, you know, and replay it, but you can actually make out what she says if you turn the volume up enough. Uh, the The audio in there is really good, and you need to be aware of that if you're ever in one of these rooms, because lots of people do things like they mutter to themselves going, oh, I'm so fucked. And if you mutter something like that to yourself, it gets picked up in there, and you're going to believe that that's going to be uh, replayed. Uh, they they have these things really well wired for all sorts of audio and yeah it's it's a bad place to be you don't want to be in this room oh, and my apologies i got my phone uh, ringing sadly that phone has uh, gotten the attention of some scammers so it just goes non-stop all right okay all right all right i'll call you back when i'm done okay This is just bizarre that they're just letting him make phone calls and that he's making phone calls there. Also, uh, I mean, keep in mind as well, you're going to be at your worst when you're sitting in this room because you're stressed. Where are the kids? Kids, Kate. The boys are sleeping. Yeah, I'm going to go out. Did she tell you what's going on? I'm trying to convince her. I'm trying to convince her to come. I think we should come. And just yeah. spend the time here, and they're going to do what they got to do with the deal, what they got to do with. And we shouldn't let them. We will go. We will go. I won't work, and we'll go and join her. So it's all paid for, and they're not going to give us the money back. And we we should be staying away from the vultures here. Are they outside? No, but I imagine they will be at some point. They're going I think to find it's a great idea. It's a great idea. You should come for that reason also. All right, I'll call Carmen on her iPad, okay? Okay, yeah, she's on her. She's on her phone. I'm very sorry, actually. Oh, you, you, have no idea, you have no idea how unbelievable this is and how strange this is. And I'll explain okay, to you I'm later. Sorry, you're in this position. No, no, it's just I hope everyone's okay and that you're okay. Oh, I'll call you back. Thank you. Bye-bye. So he just shot and killed somebody not long ago, and he's upset about how he's doing. This is also something that you could spill or that you could spin in front of a jury or in front of a, a judge. You know, here in Canada, a lot of trials are held in front of judges rather than juries. But uh, yeah, this is uh, this is not a good idea having these kinds of conversations. Anything that you do in there is recorded, and there really aren't a lot of right answers for what you're doing in here. Hi, Samantha. It's also a little unusual to me that she's wearing her gun in this room. Uh, normally, they want, normally, that's something that they're often not doing. Uh, often they will have removed their gun because they're alone with this person. Of course, they've got other people watching this on the camera, so if there's some trouble, there's uh, people to rush in. But, uh, yeah. While well, you're here, <laughs> uh, for this incident that was unfortunate earlier, 
Yeah. Yeah, I know you already agreed to talk to us and everything, and that's great. Um, we're just going to go over the rights. She's going to read these to you um, as you understand them and just sign an initial, and then uh, if you read the bottom and agree to talk to us, you sign them. As you understand them, yes. Notice how they re-emphasize, you know, you've agreed to talk to us, that's good. They don't want him backing out at this point. I see some people saying uh, that uh, him having the phone, uh, that he might be doing it sort of intentionally. I don't know. I think that he's just, I think he's not being all that smart. Um, I'm surprised he doesn't have his lawyer here. I think he's trying to play a game where he thinks that he's, uh, you know, where he's trying to put on a, a face here. And while that's worked out for him, because he's got tons of money, um, I I would not recommend this as a strategy. Uh, so first one, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say may be used against you in court or other proceedings. You have the right to consult with an attorney before making any statement or answering any questions. And you may have him or her present with you during questioning. You may have an attorney appointed to you to represent you if you cannot afford one or otherwise obtain one. Um, if you decide to answer any questions now with or without a lawyer, you have the right to stop questioning at any time or to stop questioning for the purpose of consulting a lawyer. So my only question is, am I being charged with something? All right. So first thing is, uh, when they tell you you've got a right to talk to a lawyer, you should be talking to a lawyer right away. Um, Anytime the police tell you that, it's time to phone a lawyer. Um, you know, and Alec Baldwin is not short of money. He's got enough cash that he can bring a lawyer in there. Uh, that is absolutely... And when they say you've got the right to remain silent, whenever, you know, you're hearing that, you should exercise that and shut up. Uh, this behavior where he's just going on is, uh, is not super... Uh, not super helpful, but I want to just skip back a little bit here uh, just for uh, this little in exchange that he's got here. An attorney appointed to you to represent you if you cannot afford one or otherwise obtain one. Um, if you decide to answer any questions now with or without a lawyer, you have the right to stop questioning at any time or to stop questioning for the purpose of consulting a lawyer. If they say you can stop questioning at any time, the best time is before you walked into this room. The second best time is now. So definitely stop talking. Everything after this and everything we've seen before this has been a mistake. Oh. So my only question is, am I being charged with something? No, we're just continuing. Yeah. I don't know that's why I'm, that's why I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not worried because I'm not, yeah. We, we have to do our job at, yeah, no, just tell me that at advising you your right to write my name here. Is this is a question that screws so many people over. You're not being charged with anything. Well, yet, they might have all the information they need to charge you, and they just haven't yet when you're in that room. That doesn't mean that you're not going to be charged. Uh, that And there's plenty of times when I've seen people walk into this room and they say, have I been charged with anything? And the officers say, oh, no, we're not charging you at this point. And then they talk for 30 minutes, and then the officers are like, okay, just so you know, um, now you're going to be charged with some stuff. And they go, what you said I wasn't being charged. The officer's like, yeah, changed my mind. Um, don't, when they say you are not being charged with anything yet, um, why would you want to talk and change their mind? Like, that's all you can do is change their mind to convince them that maybe they should charge you with something. So uh, he doesn't get charged at the end of this, but you might. So this is a police tactic that happens all the time in these interrogations and in these interviews, and you should be aware of it because it can really trick uh, trip people up. The investigation, yeah. just a formality. You have to do it. You're here. You do you appreciate it. Do Nothing is just a formality. Um, when they say it's just a formality, it's because they want to, uh, you know, they they want to be able to use this against you to throw you in jail. What is today? It is the 21st of October. Yeah, I'm a little slow on this news, but oh well. Oh. Long day. Well, what's interesting, not to digress on some commentary here, is that we've done this for two weeks and we did it the right way every day. Every day. You're on a set, 
to rehearse. They bring you what's called a cold gun. The gun gives you completely empty. But yeah, I've spent you know several years not shooting anybody in the in the chest. So you doing it for two weeks is you get no points for that. Chambers, or there is a cosmetic piece. So, for example, if you're the camera, and this is going to sound silly and specific, but if I'm pointing a gun close to the camera, you want to see into the cylinder that there's material in there, mm -hmm. cosmetic material. So those rounds are cosmetic rounds. Mm -hmm. They put them in, and you rehearse, mm -hmm. or even in a shot when you don't fire. Mm -hmm. I pull the gun, and you see there's some material inside the cylinder. They'd hand me a cold gun, no charges. They always hand you a cold gun with nothing in it to rehearse. And then <clears throat> when you shoot, and if you are shooting loads that are flash loads, and they're usually in three denominations, quarter, half, or full load round, so that the flash is bright mm -hmm. and the sound is loud, louder, loudest. Full load is loudest. So if you're outside, you want a full load bang, you want a loud sound. If you're inside, you can do a quarter load. Right before you shoot, everyone preps, crew puts the earplugs in, some put headphones on. The camera's there, very open, there's a loose sight screen. But you're the camera operator, and there's the camera, so I should always shoot off camera. You never shoot into the lens. And you shoot, and there's a flash and a sound. Now. So, what he's talking about are some of the safety protocols that they have on a set. So, when he talks about cosmetic rounds or dummy rounds, uh, the dummy rounds that they use on movie sets actually are made in a very particular fashion. I've actually acquired some movie dummies and that'll be for a future movie I'm or a future video. I'm not even going to be able to show them on this stream because YouTube is very particular about anything uh, firearm related on a set or on a, uh, on a live stream. Uh, but those are actually made with a little uh, ball bearing inside. And the reason why is so that you can shake them so that you can tell that they're a, a dummy, right? That way you can actually, uh, that way you can identify them fairly readily. Now, when you're dealing with something like a Colt single action army, which is the firearm that's the, they're using a Pieta replica, but uh, you know, it's a firing firearm that does that you're going to need to actually take out the the bullets and check them check each cartridge to make sure if it's uh if it's safe that is you know the proper protocol that's what he should be doing there and check each one to see if it rattles clearly that didn't happen and so he instead just relied on somebody handing him a cold gun and quite frankly he actually should have uh he should have checked that himself uh when I am at the range and somebody, you know, if somebody's there with an interesting gun and I go, hey, can I have a look at that? And the guy says, okay. And he checks it to make sure it's unloaded and then hands it to me. I, the first thing I do is I check it again. And that's not because I want to insult this guy or anything like that. It's just that I want to make sure that I'm actually, you know, being safe with something that I, you know, that I'm picking up. People make mistakes. Uh, he didn't check, and I have an issue with that. Now, in, when he's talking about these quarter load, half loads, full loads, uh, that's just for blanks. And that's because sometimes when you're pulling a trigger, you want to get uh, the flash, right? You want it to actually be seen to be going off. And so that's what he's talking about there. The Lucite screens are there to protect people. But all of this, I mean, at this point, he should be using a gun that is empty because it's a rehearsal. You know, there's no reason for them to need to have those dummy rounds in there. So even that, he should have been, you know, he should have been checking to go, hey, I've been supposedly handed a an empty gun. How hard is it to flip open the loading gate and, you know, give it a look? You You just can't. These are steps you cannot skip. And until, like, you're probably, you know, if you're a, a gun person, you're probably familiar with, you know, Cooper's rules of gun safety. Never point a gun at anything you don't wish to destroy. You know, always assume that the gun is loaded. Movie sets, they have to, uh, they have to violate those rules sometimes. Movie sets, they have to break them for, because the set might call for, like, 
it might actually call for you to point the gun, you know, close to somebody at a dangerous degree of closeness or actually at the guy. And that's why it's really important that you follow the other protocols to make sure. Um, I have a bit of a problem with the kind of, uh, you know, he's saying, oh, well, it, it wasn't my job to check it. It was somebody else's job. No, you're handed a gun. You're going to use that gun in some fashion. It's your responsibility. Ultimately, the buck stops with whoever's, you know, whoever takes that gun in their hand. And if you're not willing to take responsibility in that fashion, if you're not willing to be responsible enough to be able to take that responsibility and to take those steps, you should never handle a firearm on a set. Not a real gun, not a fake gun, nothing. You should, you know, do do other movies. Um, yeah, it's... I, I think this is something that should change. It's just that these people who cannot, you know, stand firearms and can't stand enough to learn how to use them safely and how to go through things like checking them for, you know, that they're actually loaded or unloaded as you expect them to be. Um, if you can't do that, you should not be touching a firearm or something that looks like a firearm on, on set at all. All right. So, yeah. And yeah, I see somebody in the chat was saying, uh, you know, uh, not really interested in the blame game here, especially from someone who doesn't work on movie sets. This he's being interviewed by the police. Uh, the blame game kind of is what what they're doing right now. Um, and somebody's dead. You know, somebody didn't have to be dead. That and there's responsibility for that. Uh, do I work on movie sets? No. Um, have I spoken to several movie armorers about this? You know, people who do this for a living? Yes, I have. And not one of them, not one of them said that what happened was okay. You know, that this was just fine. Uh, that there were so many safety failures that happened on this set. And he's a producer. Uh, even if nothing else, he's he's got some blame to uh, to go on here. And somebody's saying, how the heck did a live round get in the gun? Um, it's not clear, although there have been reports that uh, that these guns might have been being used during off hours to go plinking. You know, just people shooting at cans and targets and so forth. So um, that should never happen. If you are not using live rounds on set, if there is not a reason for uh, for there to be live rounds used, and there's very often not a reason for live rounds to be used. Uh, about the only time when you where you'd actually want a live cartridge on set is if you're doing something like let's say you're filming a Mythbusters show about, you know, can a can a book stop a bullet? Something like that. And you're going to be doing high speed uh, videography to see, you know, what that at that point you need an actual cartridge, you know, that fires a projectile. But you know, if you're filming a Western, you don't need it. Because even if you're doing something like, you know, pointing at something and you fire and it shatters, you're not doing that by firing an actual projectile. Whenever you see that happen in a movie, the way that's being done is with special effects pyrotechnics. And I've actually got, you know, the lowest level of pyrotechnics license. But uh, if you pull the trigger, you know, when they pull the trigger, that, you know, gun that impact is done with a, a tiny explosive or something along those lines. And they have different kinds of explosives for different kinds of things. Like if they want to have it, you know, smash a bottle, that's one kind. If they want to have it leave a dent in a metal surface, that's another kind. So yeah, it should be, uh, this should not have happened. There should have been no, uh, no live cartridges on the set at all. All right, carrying on here. I went to lunch. She disarmed me. I sat she down. She being uh, Hannah, the, Hannah. Guard, the armaments person. I when she was always handling the guns, or ninety nine percent of the time. So I would, uh, if I had a cosmetic rifle with no rounds, I would hand it to one of her assistants. I'm sitting there. 
she disarms me, we go to lunch, we come back from lunch, and they hand me the, the revolver, the, the Colt. And they, I just like so many, it's a hand again. They, they arm me, mm -hmm. and you're assuming, as we've done every time, that it's a cold gun for the rehearsal. And I... Yeah, um, assuming anything with firearms is how people die. Uh, you should not be assuming anything with firearms. Uh, and I see uh, Lisa BS, enjoy catching up with the live, just finished your AM series. Uh, also, EDB went through, so that's Emily D. Baker, went through some of the suits. Uh, one from the armor alleges sabotage. Yes, uh, that is, uh, it's certainly interesting. And the, I see the yes names, please. Uh, the reason why they want names, of course, is to create a, a better narrative here. Uh, somebody saying that wasn't a prop gun, it was a real gun used as a prop. It needed to be able to fire for realism. Here's the thing. Prop just means any object. Like, this is a prop. You know, it's it's now on a video, so it's a prop. Um, it's an actual coffee cup. It, you know, but once it's in a movie, it's a prop. Uh, prop guns are often, you know, sometimes they are uh, deactivated guns, so real guns that have been modified so they can't fire. Uh, sometimes they're just complete replicas that are just completely fake, but often they're using actual firearms, and especially on something like, uh, you know, on something like a movie set, and the reason why is because you might need it to be able to fire a, you know, a blank, like a... Uh, you know, the quarter power or half power or full power blanks that he's talking about, you might need it to be able to be fired. So, yeah. And I see somebody noting uh, prop just means any property thing on a stage set. Yes, absolutely. It's just anything there is uh, is a prop. And hey, uh, Scott Cardinal, well, <laughs> welcome to the uh, stream here. So, yeah, it's, uh, that's an important clarification here because, uh, yeah, somebody says, can and someone explain why there were even real rounds in a gun anywhere near a movie set? Uh, there should never have been, uh, there should never have been anything there. Somebody says prop guns are rubber and actual firearms that can no longer fire around. No, um, sometimes they're fully functional real guns. Uh, I went and toured uh, movie armament groups. Uh, you know, they're uh, they they're movie armors, and I toured the uh, their sort of vault. And one of their vaults is all the real guns that, you know, perfectly fire just fine because plenty of those get used on movies. So, yeah. Um, and the other thing is Screen Actors Guild Safety Bulletin says blanks can kill. Treat all firearms as though they are loaded. Uh, absolutely, because there's actually a uh, there's actually a tragic incident of an actor who had a, a blank firearm and, you know, put it to his head and fired as a joke because he thought blanks, not such a big thing, but blanks can still put a lot of force through you and it killed him. So, yeah. And I see uh, the note. Uh, yeah. Gun safety. It doesn't matter how many people have looked at it. You check first because you don't know if there's something, uh, you know, you don't know if somebody else screwed up. You don't know if a dozen people screwed up. So, all right, let's keep going here. Put the, the, the gag in the shot through the camera because I have a coat and I have a holster and I pull the coat over and I kind of cut my hands like I folded my hands. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to slowly sneak the revolver, the, the Colt, out and turn and shoot these other guys or try to shoot them. I take the coat over the thing and the camera's there. I believe my recollection is she was there, turned a bit like talking to him. So her, I think she was hit in the right armpit. But this is all I know, and that is that I take the gun out in the rehearsal. Really, he wants it very dramatic and very slow. I'm trying to sneak mm -hmm. up on them. I take the gun out, and as I take, like as it clears, as the barrel clears, all the turn and cock the gun in rehearsal. I turn and cock the gun. The gun goes off. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be a cold gun. Nothing. No flash charges. Nothing. Now, this is a puzzle to me. This is making me very emotional now. You know, but. In my time, and I'm older now, but when I was younger and I was shooting guns and stuff, I've never seen 
a theatrical flash round where the material went through someone's armpit, came out their body, and hit somebody else in the shoulder. Yeah. I'm wondering if your department is prepared to go find out what comes out of his shoulder surgically. Is that a live round? That's what we are actually looking is at. Is that a lot? Because I don't, does make any sense otherwise? Yeah, and it is a live round, and this discussion that he's having is really not helpful. Uh, like, why would you have this uh, discussion? Uh, I see people talking about uh, Brandon Lee. Brandon Lee is a bit of a different situation because Brandon Lee, uh, the situation there was a, a what they call a squib round. So it it has a projectile in it, but not full uh, full power, and that ended up leaving uh, leaving an ob like there was an object left in the barrel, and so then they load a blank, and the blank was able to propel that object and kill Mr. Lee. So that, you know, that was a tragic moment because, of course, you know, Brandon Lee was uh, was killed and, you know, he was just at the beginning of what was likely to be an incredibly, uh, uh, incredibly successful uh, career there. And yeah, but this is a different scenario because this was an actual cartridge that uh, that was able to fire. And it's really, uh, you know, He's saying he draws and fires and draws and, you know, sort of pulls the uh, pulls the hammer back, you know, as he's doing this. Well, he's in other things. He has said that uh, that he never pulled the trigger. Well, one of the things that happens is your body is actually kind of bad at discrete signals. And what I mean by that is that. When if you ask people to, you know, clench the fingers of one hand, and if they're not paying attention, they can end up moving the fingers on the other hand. Uh, if you are trying to, uh, you know, if you're trying to sort of pull something back with your thumb, as part of that gesture, you can curl your finger. I am going to wager that he had his finger on the trigger, and either as he's pulling the uh, the hammer back, his finger curls, or that he pulls out the gun and that motion of pulling it causes him to make, you know, a grabbing motion and pulls the trigger down. And then he pulls it and flicks the hammer back and causes it to, uh, you know, cause it to go off. So it's uh, his notion that it just went off with no one pulling the trigger is practically impossible. And we'll play around with the on another video, which won't be a live stream, but I will play around with one just so that we can uh, see there. Uh, Linda DB, thank you for the super sticker. And I see somebody noting uh, that uh, they're saying that I was incorrect here. The copper round had come loose from a dummy round. Uh, or I'm guessing that was copper jacketing then. Um, so yeah, regardless, it was some sort of projectile that was uh, stuck there. I see Eric Hunley saying he likely had the trigger compressed already when he pulled the hammer back. Yeah, it's hard to tell exactly, but there's all sorts of possibilities, but they all require his finger being on the trigger. And Vera de Wolf was getting to something I was going to mention here. Uh, I couldn't actually find the video in time because I gave myself a very short window here. But there's footage of his rehearsal takes. And in those rehearsal takes, you can see his finger on the trigger. When he says that his finger was nowhere near the trigger, um, he's not being honest to people. Uh, his finger was on the trigger. It was clearly negligent and clearly, uh, you know, it is, you know, I don't know if he's going to be found to be legally negligent, but in terms of this is just something that should never have happened. And Elise Taylor, thank you for, uh, for the membership there. All right. Let's, uh, and I see somebody saying trigger pulled back while you retract the hammer is how you do cowboy fan firing. Uh, yes. If you, when people fan a trigger and you might've seen this in cowboy movies, you know, you hold the trigger down on some guns, not all of them will do it. And then you move the trigger, the hammer back. And because the trigger is pulled down already, it'll just drop onto each uh, cartridge in turn. So uh, joining late on a vacation in big bear, California, which does not rival Jasper, but is close enough for an expat to reminisce about her calf past life in Calgary. Yes. I forgive you. Love your input. Well, thank you. Uh, and yeah, uh, 
so apparently legal vices did a stream of the interviews for the rust incident i'll probably look at some others as we go the amount of incompetency for all involved is mind-boggling prop master sarah admitted to throwing spent rounds away i mean you want to dispose of things properly as as you go and hopper became a youtube member thank you very much um yeah this set was such a disaster you had people leaving the set because they were saying that there were safety problems you had there was a previous negligent discharge on the set that didn't kill anybody. But here's the thing. If I'm, you know, if I'm running a movie and I'm not qualified to be a film armorer, but let's say that I was, uh, you know, let's say that I was doing film armor anyway, which would probably put me on the same footing as the people do in the armor there. And uh, it, uh, if there was a single, negligent discharge that happens on the set i'd be saying shut everything down we are going to get to the bottom of this because holy crap right this is like if you're out driving and your brakes fail and then later they re-engage and you manage to stop the car and you decide you know what i'm just going to keep driving this car notwithstanding the fact that the brakes just failed on me i'm sure it's going to be fine yeah, it's, uh, yeah. And I see Seth Rossman uh, noting, I'm a film and television armor. I was interviewed on CTV and CBC regarding the Baldwin incident. We reviewed this closely, and sadly, there was a complete procedural breakdown on this set. Absolutely. And I have seen some people uh, venturing a, uh, you know, a murder notion. It's not a murder. Uh, as uh, Mr. Rossman here is noting that... Uh, there were so many things that were being done improperly on this uh, set that, you know, it, it's not a murder. It was just expect to, you know, this was something that could be anticipated because it was so, uh, they were doing things so badly. Um, so, yeah. All right, let's keep going here. Yeah. It hits her in the arm, it comes out of her shoulder, goes into his shoulder, and he just told me on the phone, I talked to Joel. He said, they showed me the x-ray, and the shape of the thing in my shoulder is the shape of a bullet. Now, all the rounds, I was told, you need to verify that this is an important note. They take the gun, they enter it, and all the rounds that are in there were either dummy rounds, no flash, cold rounds, or rounds with a flash. In the rehearsal, there should have been nothing. It should have been a cold gun with no rounds inside or dummy rounds, cosmetic rounds, no flash. I take the gun out slowly, I turn, I cock the pistol, bang, it goes up, she hits the ground, she goes down. He goes down, screaming. He said, Jesus Christ, he, and I'm going. And I thought that maybe sometimes the wadding can come out if you're closer to get a burn. Two actors who killed themselves with guns, with theatrical guns, John Eric Hexham and Brandon Lee, they put the live round in, and I'm told even with the flash powder, you can cause contusions and you can do a brain, brain bleed and die, which both of them died. Right. Brandon Lee did not put the gun to his head. Brandon Lee was shot at a distance with the... So, yeah. Um, it's kind of interesting that he knows that there is some history with this, but he also is completely mangling this and um, kind of slamming Brandon Lee's memory here. I think with Brandon Lee, there was a, 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 a piece of material lodged in the thing that shot from the floor, something. Yeah. I don't remember vividly, but my point is, I've been doing this, I, I shot enough guns in my day in movies, I've never seen this before, or a flash round. But from my understanding is, can I borrow your pen for me? you could even borrow me. My, my understanding is... Now, the police will usually try to get you to draw stuff or write stuff. I think this is probably the first time the police officers have had the guy going, can I borrow your pen? Um, if you are being interrogated and, you know, I use the word interrogation on Twitter and somebody was responding and they said, no, no, it's not an interrogation. It's an interview. Interview is the word police like to use for an interrogation because, you know, if you get brought into, you know, if you get brought into this room and you're being told you're in being interviewed, well, people are a lot more chill about that than they are about, you know, anything else, you know, than if they're being told that they're being interrogated. So 
interview is police propaganda language for an interrogation. He's in an interrogation. And I see somebody saying, uh, are female interrogators more effective with male suspects? I don't know. I mean, I think it just comes down to are good interrogators more effective. Um, I haven't seen anything special from these interrogators so far, but he hasn't even let them get a word in edgewise. He's just talking. And the proper thing for an interrogator to do when you've got somebody who just wants to talk is you let them talk. Um, you let them talk basically as long as they're willing. And then once they start to tire out, you start bringing them back to things. Yeah, and Alec Baldwin went back and forth between knowing nothing and giving a lecture throughout his questioning. I mean, he clearly knows enough that he should know better than what he's saying here. So, yeah. Um, yeah, never never start drawing them pictures or anything else because these are going to be exhibits at a trial if there is a trial. Um, I can guarantee you that whatever you draw ends up you know, going into an evidence bag as soon as you're out of the room. Back in a... In a in a bullet, Thank you for the super you know, here's the thing with the pin, and here's the, the, the bullet or something. Now here, when you have a cosmetic round, no flash, no nothing, they drill a hole in the side of the brass to show, to signify that it's a cosmetic round. There's nothing in there. So you could have no checked power. easily. And when, but when you, have a, when you have a flash round, and, you have the, and, there's, and there's stuff in there, wadding and powder to make the charge, this material here, that is the bullet, is made of a clay or some material that just disintegrates. So what you have is bang, and you see the flash go bang, and you hear the sound, but nothing, there's no projectile. Mm -hmm. And what I'm curious about is what came out of that bullet that went through her body and into his shoulder? That's pretty powerful. I, 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 I've never heard it. Now, some people say <coughs> you can lodge material in the barrel accidentally, a rock, something, that happens. Which is why she, every time we've done this, I'm here to tell you to testify that every time we've done this, she's done it right. She cleaned the barrel, made sure nothing was lodged in there. We went hot when they were ready. It was announced, going hot. Crew gets ready. And then all of a sudden, you're the camera, and I shoot away from you. I sit down like, bang, bang, bang. And flashes are coming out. We shoot the rounds. She cleans the barrel every time, and she checks the, that the rounds are all cosmetic rounds, for the, or nothing in the chamber for the rehearsal. And he should be checking, too. I mean... Uh, if you look around there, you know, there is video of other actors doing this and having a look at it. And I see somebody saying, can I turn on closed captions? I don't actually have closed captions for this and it can't do closed captions on a, uh, on a live video. I don't think I can turn them on, on this. Uh, I don't think I have a means to do that. So I'm laughing because my husband, former cop, just said the same thing you did about interviews. My dad attorney always told us, do not talk, and you're more likely to walk. Absolutely. Um, I have very, very rarely seen people talk their way out of this room. Um, I have very often seen people talk, uh, yeah, talk their way uh, into more trouble. So, yeah. Yeah, I see people saying, you know, turn on the closed caption for the Baldwin interview. I don't have closed captions for the Baldwin interview. I can't actually turn that on here. So I apologies on that. Uh, so, all right. She hands me the gun. I'm assuming she's done it the right way. She's done it the last two weeks. I put it in the holster. I pull it out slow. We're rehearsing. We're not filming anything. I pull it out, so I turn, cock the pistol, bang, it goes up, and she hits the ground. And then he starts screaming. And I'm thinking, in a flash round, I could see maybe if there was wadding or there's some stuff like that, that's hot, and maybe it hits you and burns you, and then they, they say sometimes mm -hmm. that happens. But remember, we're rehearsing, so no one's protected. So it's all supposed to be this one, cosmetic one. Or, or, nothing. or nothing. For the rehearsal, the gun is normally empty. Mm -hmm. But my point is, is that they were standing in positions they wouldn't ordinarily be in because they assumed it was an empty, cold gun. We weren't shooting, we were rehearsing. That's a vital difference. So, Notice how he pushes the blame here. He says uh, they were standing in places where they, uh, you know, where they wouldn't normally be. Well, maybe you stop doing it, you know, if you, if they're not, you know, if you don't think it's safe, then you say no. Like, 
I'm sorry if it's just your uh if the you know if it says hey in rehearsal we want you to point the gun at you know this space and there's somebody standing in the space and they say hey let's go for you know let's go it's like uh no um stop like you need to move that is not a space you can stand in um uh, yeah and I see uh, the other thing he mentions is he says, uh, you know, it's just a rehearsal. So no one's protected. Everyone is protected in a freaking rehearsal. It's the same, you know, you, they set up all, they, they should have had, you know, the, the, uh, the screens, they should have had people out of the way. They should have had all of these things. And yeah, it's, it's just nuts. And I see, um, uh, Seth Rossman here saying, when I'm armoring on set, anyone that has a concern or sees a safety concern has the ability and the right to speak out without any concern or uh, I assume that was uh, repercussions. Yeah, and this is exactly it. It's, you know, same thing with, uh, you know, when I'm working on a fireworks uh, site, right? Um, you could be at this for all of five minutes. You know, this is your first fireworks site ever. And if you see something that you think is unsafe, speak up. And I have never gotten into trouble for, you know, on a fireworks site going, I think this is a problem. It's, oh, let's check that out. And, oh, no, this is not a problem. Or, oh, yes, this is a problem. And we should fix that right away. Um, that's absolutely how it's got to be. You've got to promote a culture of, you know, being able to, you've got to promote a culture of safety, which means being able to intervene and to you know to mention stuff when there's uh when there's an issue uh somebody says are you able to just get up and leave one of these interviews if you're not under arrest you can just leave he's not under arrest uh they already told him he can stop this at any time he can walk out of there he's just not doing that and yeah i so it's bizarre that he's just uh keeping on going here well, she's here if the camera's here and she's standing here talking to the guy and I'm on a bench here and Joel's behind her and this guy, this is not proportionate because obviously the camera's not as big as her body, but I draw the gun slowly and aim off camera and there's supposed to be nothing in there. So she's not protecting herself and standing off. I'm shooting in a direction and everybody is supposed to be to that side of the camera. There's nobody in my line. So right now, what he's telling me is that he was negligent here in terms of what he was doing. And again, I don't know if it's going to be legally negligent, but in terms of like gun safety, if there's not supposed to be anybody in your line and there is somebody in your line, you stop what you're doing. You know, it's just like, hey, uh, if I go to the gun range and the range is hot, but I see a dude walking out on the range, I don't shoot him because I know better. You know, you just, it's, oh, this is so maddening. What are my predictions for a wrongful death lawsuit? I think that, uh, I think somebody's going to end up paying. It's going to be a matter of who pays and how much. I think it's going to be some of the questions here. Uh, everybody on set is at fault. What a hot mess. He's chronically tried to save face. They should all go down for this. I mean, I, uh, he's not convincing me here that he is, uh, you know, that he's, uh, an innocent here quite the opposite he's uh really talking himself into trouble here and eliza thank you for the super sticker here and uh yeah let's uh keep going this guy this is frustrating because uh somebody died over this and his what he's doing is nuts um and uh, Seth Rossman, really thank you for being in the chat here. I really uh, I appreciate uh, that you're here. As I mentioned before, I've talked to several movie armors about this stuff. And yeah, they note in film production, we never actually have an actor point a firearm at another actor. We use the cameras to uh, cheat the angles so it looks like the firearm is pointed directly at the other talent. I mean, movies are fantastic for this sort of thing where you can... Uh, you know, there's all sorts of tricks where you can have movies where it's like one actor who's the big name kind of feels self-conscious about the fact that they're short. So they get made to look like they're taller than the other talent who's actually taller than they are. 
um, in every shot, just with careful camera angles, you know, but you can do things where you have one person standing here and the other person stands, you know, a foot back and is pointing the gun and they do clever camera trickery so that it looks like it's right at the person. But still, even if it's, you know, you're pointing two feet off or whatever else, you still don't, you still want to treat that like it is a, uh, like it's a, a live round because you never know, but you also check and check and recheck to make sure it's not. Uh, 99% of the time, the gun shot a blank every time. I mean, this is when you're engaging in super, you know, in, in hazardous activities, you have to be this level of careful. You have to be super cautious. Um, you know, my gun range, the gun range I go to has been in operation for decades and has never had a firearm related accident because people are careful. Um, yeah. And uh, I see TGR Ghost Rider. Thank you for the super chat. All I hear is intentional actions, pulling, pointing, cocking, and those actions led to a death. Yep. Um, yeah. I see we have a safe distance of eight to 10 feet when discharging blanks. So I assume that's like distance away from each other. And the angles are always cheated to ensure safety. Yes. A lot of these rules came about because of Brandon Lee, because, you know, that was a tragic death but it really caused people to up the safety uh you know the safety standards on these things and that's a good thing um so let me see how does the defense lawyer defend a client determined to give every plaintiff against him all the evidence they need to convict him this kind of behavior is maddening this is what criminal defense is uh so many people go in and give like a full confession and then you're just trying to figure things out as we go uh my kid, uh, I assume kid took archery in the fourth grade. Those school children took more responsibility for the safety of her, those around them than he has at any point. Yep, not surprising. So, uh, all right, let's keep going here. Nobody. And so when I shoot the gun, so when the rehearsal, I'm assuming I have an empty gun, and the gun goes off, she's right in front of me. Mm -hmm. She's as far from me as I am from between, the difference between maybe you and the door. Okay, like so very close proximity. It was, just a very, it was a very tight shot. Okay. The shot was here. Of me, not of me, it's of me pulling the gun slowly so it turned cock. Okay. As far as I'm concerned, that's as good as, an, as a confession right there. Uh, so, Kendrick, Kate, uh, thank you for the super chat. And I've got somebody going, uh, what you're doing is scummy, bottom-feeding YouTuber. I mean, hey, I hope you're enjoying the content. But also, having a discussion of legal issues is what lawyers do. So... Um, saddle up. <laughs> keep let's uh, keep going. This is ridiculous. The uh, you know that he's just saying, oh well, she wasn't supposed to be in the shot, but I was okay with pointing my gun at her anyway. Come on. And she's right there, vulnerable, in a position she wouldn't ordinarily be if we were shooting, and, she, and just then, boom, yeah. she hits the ground. Okay. All right, I'm gonna back you up just a little bit, yeah. okay? Yeah. How long have you been on set? I arrived uh, Monday the 11th. Okay. I started my fittings and my, they were already were shooting the week before. And the 11th of October? Monday the 11th, I flew in from New York. I flew from New York to Denver, Denver to Albuquerque, because there's no direct flights, and then drove from Albuquerque to here. Okay. Rehearsed and fitted and did all my preparatory stuff. But that was in October, correct? That was Tuesday the 12th. Yeah. I flew on the 11th, rehearsed on the 12th, started shooting the 13th, Wednesday the 13th, that's sort of shooting. Okay. We shoot a Wednesday through Sunday schedule. We're off Monday, Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So the entire time you've been on set, have you seen the same armor? And her crew, yeah. Everybody. How many people are on her crew? Uh, my guess is that what I witness is three. Okay. All young women. Hannah and two other women. All right. And very often they're tasked with me because we're not shooting every day. Guns, we're not, there's no armaments every day. They dress me with my holster, my knife. We're, the, the film is set in 1888, so I'm armed with the classic weaponry of the cowboy era. Okay. And so they would make sure I was dressed properly. You know, 80, 85% of their task is to make sure I'm dressed with everything properly. The armors? The armors. Or just well, the armorers 
wardrobe doesn't necessarily, they sometimes trade back and forth, but wardrobe doesn't necessarily deal with my holster okay. and, and the knife, but that's a prop. The armorer, Hannah, and her team, they dealt with me being knifed and that being lashed properly, so it looks proper. Okay. And the uh, holster. Okay. And so it was wardrobe as much as it was props, as much as it was armaments. Okay. Do you know Hannah's last name? No. Do you know what she looks like? Or can you describe yeah. uh, her? Multicolored like? hair, glasses, uh, you know, uh, not too tall. Everyone knows her pretty well because her father is a very famous armaments guy. He's a guy that did guns and movies for decades. He's very well known. Okay. So this is, I mean, when he's talking about, you know, when he's flying where and so forth, um, the officers don't care about that, but they're also not going to interrupt him because they'll just keep letting him talk. So, you know, they don't ever want to get you to stop talking because if they stop you talking, uh, they're worried that you might just say, okay, I'm done here and then leave. So they're going to try to, you know, they may try to bring him around, but, um, uh, they, they're not going to just say, okay, well, we're, uh, you know, well, that's it, uh, you know, and stop him from, from you know, with a hard stop kind of thing. Uh, and I see uh, Sutarkin, uh, okay, but if it was supposed to be a rehearsal to set up the shot, as it would be if the DP or camera op were there, why would she be where the cameras wouldn't be? I mean, he said she's not supposed to be there, so him, you know, being willing to keep going is really a problem to my mind. And Eric Hunley, he's a complete jerk, but please note that Baldwin doesn't know she's dead yet. That comes later. Yes, and that is fair. However, he does know that she's been shot. And, you know, I think he's being real cavalier for, for those circumstances. Um, it's a uh, Fred Neck Preppy. From now on, I'm going to refer to Ian as scubby bottom-feeding attorney Ian Runkle. I should totally make a shirt that says that. Uh, just to... Uh, so, Yeah. Uh, uh, Peggy Riordan says, I think they should use plastic replicas and add in the sound and special effects. No need to have real guns on a movie set. Um, I think you'd notice if they did that. I think that you would be, uh, I think you'd notice the, the difference because, uh, it's still hard to do and, you know, people trying to fake recoil and so forth. I suspect that would just annoy the heck out of me if I was watching a movie and I could just tell the whole time. Um, I'm the guy who spots when they're using airsoft guns and just goes, oh, come on. Um, I'm also, you know, the guy who spots when they uh, show the casings and I can tell that it's a blank. And I'm just like, oh, you guys should have done that. And there's so many situations where you uh, uh, where where movies do that. And it just makes me twitch all the time. Um, once you're once you're sort of a person who does firearm stuff, uh, you start noticing this all the time. Um, so yeah. Oh, and that is Potter. Um, he has opinions. I just asked him if maybe he could not have opinions for a bit. And so far he's, uh, not listening. All right, let's keep going. She's the daughter of the famous gun guy, movie gun guy. And what about the other girls in her crew? I don't remember their names. Okay. Do you know what they look like? A blonde, thin, not too short, you know, kind of medium height, and brunette, someone on the shorter side, maybe the same height as Hannah, brunette, and uh, and also there's a, there's, you go back and forth between, they're wearing a mask most of the time on set, they right. in order to do that. But I've seen them with their mask off. Okay. All right. What time did you guys... I'll just note here, uh, this is just a bit of a comparison, but uh, one of the things that we heard in, you know, with Depp is that he did make a, an effort to learn people's names. I'm betting Johnny Depp would have known the names of, you know, the, the armorers there. Um, just kind of speaks to character. I'm bad with names, but I mean, I make the effort to try and I fail because I am super bad at names. Um, but I kind of get the sense that he just, Never cared. Uh, yeah. Start today. I don't know what time they started. I came in slightly later, but they had a couple of shots without me in the morning, so I came in at, uh, I guess I arrived there at like about quarter to eight. Okay. Accurate. Normally I'm there at like 6.30. All right. 
And then anything abnormal in the day? Who handed, or should I say, who handed you your weapon in the day? Handed. Handed it. Okay. And physically handed or put it in the holster? Handed it to me. Okay. She would show me the gun. Okay. Or she'd say, go get cold gun. Yeah, and so uh, Seth Rosman noting that, you know, the talent he's worked with always knows, you know, is I just want to point out, these are people who are, like, essential to your safety. Uh, this isn't, like, some random, you know, person. It's, you should already sort of know everybody out there, but, uh, you know, you should know the people you're interacting with. But this is, like, uh, this is kind of important. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, maybe he's terrible with names, but that's not the vibe he gives me. I think he just sort of gives me a, the vibe that he just never cared. Uh, so, Emily, if JD can convince the world he has scissors for fingers, surely a fake gun could be feasible. Yes, I mean, uh, I totally believe that he had scissors for fingers, didn't you? Uh, so, yeah. Say test it or some language to India. She handed me the gun, said it was fine. And she said, do you want to check? And I always didn't want to insult her. I said, we never had a problem. Yeah. And I said, oh, I'm good. So, and the first AD very often will ask periodically. He'll say, let me check. Okay. And they'll have two people check for this very reason that we don't have any, fla forget about live rounds of bullets, that we have any flash rounds in the gun while we're rehearsing. Because if someone wants to indicate, and they're bad at thinking, they pull the trigger on the gun, you just hear the hammer, the, 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 the dead sound of the hammer hitting, and, and you have no flash rounds at all in there for the rehearsal. The, the, re the rehearsal gun should be empty. Okay. And, 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 and as I said, for the two weeks I've been shooting, it has been empty. We haven't had one problem. And you ha have you physically checked that or just by... She announces to me that it's, that it's clean. Okay. She'll say, cold gun, we rehearse. Then when she's done, she takes the gun, goes off to a corner. She has a kit, like a zip fanny pack with her uh, uh, elements in there. She puts the flash rounds in there. She'll say, you know, uh, uh, quarter load, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lower sound. Or she'll say full load. And if I'm shooting, if you're the crew and you're shooting me close, even if I say the full load, it is rather loud. It's very loud. Okay. She's always announcing what's going to happen. And I'll just note here, the first AD should never have his hands on a film production firearm. Only the armor and the talent should ever touch any firearm on a film set, period. Yes, absolutely. You want to keep this... You want as few people handling the gun as possible just to avoid this kind of thing, right? You want to avoid any of these sorts of issues. And you notice how often he, he's he gone back and forth, you know, to tell the detectives about all this knowledge he has and to, uh, you know, to uh, sort of, <laughs> you know, he's kind of bragging about how much he knows. Uh, that's... A, really dangerous to be doing and really arrogant to be doing in this kind of room. But also, he's just kind of, uh, you know, he's trying to snow them a little bit. And uh, this is, I note the, even when I call a firearm cold or hot, the actor checks at my presence. Absolutely. And I, you know, when I'm on the range and, uh, you know, and somebody says, here, I'm handing you an unloaded gun. First thing I do is I check it. 100 um, percent the the particular kind of gun he has a little more of a pain in the butt to check than some because it doesn't have a cylinder that swings out it's got a loading gate so you'd have to you know spin through the uh, the cylinders but you do it like you do it because people's lives might be on the line and i see somebody was offering a, a great suggestion saying i should send uh, seth rossman a uh, a link uh, Seth, I'm on Twitter. If you want, uh, shoot me a uh, uh, shoot me a DM, and I can send you a link to join in if you'd like. Because um, yeah, your everything you've been saying is fantastically useful. So if you would uh, want to join us, that's uh, that's great. And if not, because I get that uh, you know that there can be professional issues and so forth, um, that's also cool too. So yeah, all right. All right. She's been very good about that. So, have you guys backtracking a little bit on this? Um, you know, because she's telling you what's in these guns. Um, have you guys been practicing with those quarter loads, the full loads, all that through the past couple weeks? 
or have you shot with them? I came in on Tuesday. That's what I did Tuesday, okay. the 12th. I came to the ranch, rode the horse. I just got used to that, and because uh, they have a double who Thank really you. rides in the distance, they're really fast, and all the athleticism you see in the armor horse, and they come to a watch, and another guy riding as a horse. Okay. Get quite a crew of them. So today was not the first day that. No, I shot okay. on Tuesday the 12th with the uh, uh, the uh, Henry, the the, the lever, uh, uh, you know, arm action lever, uh, the lever action rifle, okay. and the pistol. I just shot both. Okay. And but she was there. Is he always bragging about his knowledge and then he's like the arm action? Uh, uh, he finally does get to lever action rifle, but it took him a while. Uh, he's not super bright, but uh, he's trying to uh, he's trying to uh, pretend. All right, moving back forward. What time did you guys break for lunch today? Yeah, we've mentioned that. Usually, I think today was day we broke at 12 30. Okay. And who took the weapon at that time? Hannah. Physically took it. Always knows. Rarely do the other ladies, the two other women, handle the pistol that were that's live shooting in the scene. As I said, I have the Henry in my hand as a prop. I'd be running through the scene, but no, no bullets, nothing. When they say cut, I could hand it to the blonde girl. Okay. okay. But whenever we were interacting with somebody where rounds were going to go in the gun, you would have flash rounds in the scene. We shot flash rounds. It was only Hannah. Okay. Only with her fanny pack with the rounds in there, her equipment. Okay. Um, do you know what time you guys got back from lunch? <laughs> well, if any guns, I guess it's one thirty by the time we all get back to the set up. Uh, there's a base camp and there's the set. Mm -hmm. So we go to the base camp for lunch, they always just drive back, get their wardrobe touched up, get their hair touched up, and make up whatever we do, and then we're on set with about an hour all before we go back on the set. Okay. And was Hannah the one to physically hand you the gun at yes. point? Um, um, shoot me an email? During the time uh, that you had it, Uncle was the baby at email 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 email? Email? Okay. Did you see where she got the gun from? No. Um, she has a station somewhere with all her stuff. Okay. The the elements and a gun and a cu couple different guns. Guns for the other actors and some machine guns holding guns. Is anybody else allowed in that area? I don't know, but I know that on this, I, I've never seen anything that was out of the ordinary. She had like a, sometimes they have a, a cart, like almost like you were using like a hospital catering, and I might have like a big plastic tray, a dark plastic tray, two levels and wheels. Um, I think that's what she had, but many of the departments have that, and uh, on that tray would be her, or something like that. I don't recall what exactly hers was, but, but they have a station that they bring to the set okay. for her to put all of her stuff, and uh, uh, if the weather is cooperative, and sometimes they put it under a tent, if it looks like it might rain, it rain the dam or some property. But uh, she has a little place she would go to, and I think she has a truck where she stores it, when, when they wrap it, but it goes into a truck and she takes off, and it's her responsibility to, to uh, secure the prop weapons. Everything in there. Which are real guns. Are real guns. Um, can you actually describe the gun to me? Uh, it's a Colt, a period Colt. Uh, in our emails back and forth when we were prepping the film, <laughs> she showed me just a couple different styles of guns. This is not a big budget movie, so we didn't have a lot of choices. You know, you, 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 she showed you three or four choices. I said, give me the biggest gun you've got. Okay. And, uh, uh, and so I didn't, uh, and she showed me different guns. Uh, by email and different knives by email, uh, cruder knives that were made to put like someone fashioned the handle out of like L corn or things like that. I took a traditional knife, a leather strap, a handle. Um, we went back and forth about the holster and the material, and uh, we just had a, a relatively brief conversation. I, I'm having made a lot of movies, I know how not to stress them out about the budget. When she shows me something, I try to make that work. And so uh, she showed me, I said, just give me the big cult. We were done. So, uh, I mean, he actually picked a pretty classic gun. Uh, the single action army is like, it is a classic uh, Western gun. Um, so, yeah, somebody says, how differently would this have gone if it was an actor no one knows on the set versus him? Uh, I think very badly for the actor. So, yeah. Uh, Miranda Lorian, thank you for the uh, $2 uh, super sticker there. And, uh, 
what is it? Uh, I'm just the other thing I'll just sort of mention here while he's talking about knives. If you've seen Bad Times at the El Royale, uh, there's a knife that shows up at a sort of key plot point in that movie, and I know the guy who made it. It's actually the guy who is my uh, my sword guy is the person who made the uh, the knife for that movie. Unfortunately, he does not have that. Uh, uh, unfortunately, he doesn't have that prop anymore, or I totally would have tried to uh, hit him up for it and seen what it might have taken. I might actually hit him up to, uh, so, uh, to try to, uh, <laughs> try to get a, I might hit him up to try to get a copy of that. Uh, Sorry, just uh, shooting an email back here. Uh, just trying to uh, bring on somebody here. All right, let's uh, keep going. And on that Tuesday, the 12th, I came and shot that gun. Okay. What color is it? Uh, I believe it's a brown handle because she showed me two of the larger Colts. One had a cherry colored handle and one had a brown handle. And I chose the brown handle. You didn't want the cherry. I could show you my emails in my phone. <laughs> Yes, do not offer to show uh, your email okay. to the cops. Like Carol's Dark Sarcasm, thank you for the $5. Yeah, thank you for the $5. Thank you for the $5. Thank you for the $5. Well, you always have people in films. I mean, they go to an extensive extent. You wouldn't believe some films if they have the budget, the details you go into. Of all the things you wear jewelry, hats, watches, guns, cars. I mean, there's. People sit down. I mean, I've made a lot of films, and the films that had bigger budgets, you could spend a whole week going to rehearsal, reading with the director. The writer goes and rewrites. Stop the bragging. The and then once you're done rehearsing the text with the director, the producers, and the writer, when you're done reading, they'll go make amendments. But when they hear it come out of your mouth, they go, let's change that line. The way Bob says that, and then they go, they go, then you go right to wardrobe, props, you go do a lot of stuff. Okay. All right, so you get back from lunch, get ready, she hands you the gun. Um, was this inside or outside? We inside the church, the church okay. set. And was it the first rehearsal that the incident happened? Yeah, I believe so, because we talked about, as we were going to lunch, we're always talking about what's next. Okay. So as we were rehearsing scenes, he said, now I want to do a scene where uh, we've done other shots before lunch. He said, when we come back from lunch, we'll do this. And he said, I want you to pull out, show me. Because I was showing you what I thought was the best angle to see the glint of the gun under my coat. Because you want the scene to work, the shot to work. So where are the holsters here? The gun is here. My coat comes around. And I held my hand like it was like I was just cupping my hands. Like I was just resting. Okay. And I showed him in the rehearsal. So when we came back after lunch, we rehearsed for the camera, and I took the gun. I really, I'm showing him. I'm going. I'm going to go like this, like this, like this. Cock and turn. Bang! It went off. The first time. Okay. So it was it was your. It was the very first, first time that we were shooting that shot that we were rehearsing for that shot. Okay. Because your finger was on the trigger. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, saying I have a runkle, you have a bias as clear as day. He's not bragging. He's describing his experience and trying to establish the validity of his experience. Yeah, when he's going on and on about the show, the movies he's been on with the big budgets and how they spend so much time on it, um, that's not relevant. There's, this is un, unrelated to anything. So, yeah, uh, I stand by that being bragging. That camera shot. Um, and you may, if you don't know this. <clears throat> Did you happen to see, so obviously you guys left from that upper, your upper shooting area to go have lunch, or did you eat lunch up there? No, we always go back to the base camp for lunch, okay. for the stage. Yeah, did the, the armors, or did you see the armors go down? No. No. Nor would I. Okay. Yeah. Well, once they're gone, I'm gone. Okay. Do well, people no. stay up on set, or does everybody go down? Well, there are many people who will forego lunch. Okay. I'm not, I say that back, not many. There are some who will forego lunch because they have work to do. Okay. Some of them will hold them a plate. Some of them will they'll bring their own lunch. They just, many people, they, uh, um, they make sacrifices because of their pride for their department. Mm -hmm. They may sit there and say, I think I need to paint that wall and touch up that wall. I think I need to distress those boots. They all have work to do. Mm -hmm. And very often, a small number of people will stay up top 
but we drive down from the set to the base camp. The caterer is there in need, but maybe a modest number of people stay up there. Okay. All right. And then I just want to clarify, really, um, I know you're drawing something. All right. So when you had pulled out the gun, obviously. Uh, so Josh N says, I'm a fan, Runkle, but you've got this wrong. Sorry, an actor isn't responsible for live ammunition being brought on set. They would never take out a round to shake the round, as it would break rules. I'm sorry, I've talked to a whole bunch of armorers who have said exactly the opposite of that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, no. And I've seen pictures from sets, which I can't share with you because they're, you know, armorers sending me stuff that, uh, you know, that is sort of backstage that they don't have permission to broadcast of actors literally checking guns. Um, I've seen multiple pictures of that. So yes, they do. Um, yeah, no, it's when actors are uh, taking responsibility, that's fantastic. Now I see we've got Seth Rossman in the backstage, but I've got uh, uh, a, an indication of devices not connected. Oh, Let's just see here. Uh, I hope that means he's got a mic connected. I have a mic connected. Excellent. So, <laughs> all right. So, uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, Seth Rossman, who uh, I understand works in the armory, uh, I, the armory business. I do. Yeah. How you doing, everybody? My name is uh, my name is Seth Rossman. I work for a company called Gunslingers, and we are a Canadian film and television armament house uh, operating out of Toronto, Ontario. Nice. Uh, last time I was in in uh, toronto i should have tried to uh tried to uh touch base with you guys but uh, um, next time you're in town feel free to reach out we'd be happy to have you i would uh i'd love to i i went and saw um your competition i guess uh, yeah i heard you mentioning that yeah you went by to see <laughs> the guys over at mag charlie yeah yeah and uh good yeah. guys oh and that's one thing i've sort of got the impression of in is that in the armor business it's not there's not like a whole lot of contentious. No, you know, absolutely people. not. No, no, no. You know, we so, we yeah. work very closely together. The companies all know each other. There's only a handful of us operating here in Canada uh, that are actually licensed as armament houses. And, and we definitely work together. There's, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a greater sense of, of safety, security, and professionalism that supersedes any kind of competitive factor that we might suffer. Well, and you guys probably have to work together sometimes if there's, you know, call for more guns than one of you has versus the other. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. A lot of times, um, you know, for example, Mag will get a contract to supply armaments for a production and then we'll get contacted by that same production to provide them with, say, uh, a SWAT team. So under that instance, we would come in, we'd bring the SWAT truck, we'd bring the guys, we'd bring the gear, the guns, and we'd actually deploy the effect for that scene. So you'd actually have two armament houses working on that same production at the same time. Yeah, so I mean, I kind of feel like this is a, a business where uh, if you're sort of a jerk, you probably don't last long. No, that's right. Yeah, you definitely don't last long. That's for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure you've been following this story as the same way I have. Uh, you know, it's yeah, just yeah. it's just so so it's, needlessly tragic. It is, and you know, when this first happened, um, the morning that this happened, I was at our shop. And my phone was ringing off the hook and it, it kept coming up CTV, CTV, CTV. <laughs> and I kept hitting ignore, hitting ignore. I was thinking it was a client that was contacting us for a show. And I was in the middle of stuff and I kept hitting ignore, hitting ignore. And then um, finally one of the guys said, answer the phone, man. This is getting crazy. And I picked it up and the guy on the other end said, hey, listen, we're wondering if we can come down and interview about the Alec Baldwin shooting. That was how I found out this had happened. I found out from CTV calling to interview us that something had taken place. So I jumped right on the internet and started to do as much research as I could before CTV landed on our doorstep. And uh, right off the gate, everything that we were seeing right from the very get-go uh, just screamed um, bad news right from the start. And I see you've got a channel. Um, so we pinned that there. Hopefully uh, some people will go check that out. Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> somebody was just asking, under what conditions would you have uh, a live cartridge on set? Absolutely never. That would never happen. There's never a reason in film and TV that we would ever bring a real round onto a film set. It's not something we do. We're there to create the illusion of an actual firearm discharging, not to actually make a real firearm discharge. That's not what we do. Yeah, I've heard the one exception is if you're doing something like a Mythbusters thing where you're actually filming a gunshot. For right. Like that's, a yeah, that's different. We're talking about a reality TV scenario. And under that type of a situation, yes, you might deploy a real firearm, but the conditions would be beyond 
a severe. I mean, it would be in a closed set. It would be in a closed environment. There would be minimal people involved. Uh, safety yeah. protocols and procedures would be through the roof, absolutely through the roof. Uh, one that I heard of, basically, they said that they were bringing in the cartridges from a truck uh, one at a time. Yes. But for each shot, it was yep. a sealed box, one cartridge. They bring it out to the scene. They opened it up. They put it in. They fired it. And it was like, okay, um, we think we need another shot. So the guy right. had to go back and get another, you know, just so that they knew exactly how many there. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, our licensing here in Canada, uh, we're governed by the RCMP. And the local police departments are what oversee our, our actual operations. But our licensing is issued by the Chief Firearms Office, uh, which is a division of the RCMP. So for us, it's actually stated within our licensing that at no time are we ever allowed to actually bring a live round onto a film set. When it comes to storage, we're not even allowed to store live rounds with our firearms. They have to be completely separate at all times, same as if you were just a, 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 you know, a, a civilian shooter that was storing his firearms in his home or, or you know, her storing her. You can't keep your ammunition with your gun. Same yeah. thing in the film world. We cannot store our ammunition with our, with our firearms. And our ammunition is just blanks. And we're not even allowed to store that with our firearms. So there would never be a time other than, you know, like you were mentioning, where we would be doing a reality TV scenario that uh, a, a real round would ever, ever come into play. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. And, you know, for the people who haven't dealt with the chief firearms office, uh, I am uh, currently in the process of applying for something similar to the license that, uh, you know, that uh, Gunslingers has uh, in the sense that I want to be able to have firearms for the purpose of sometimes making some of my videos, mm -hmm. um, you know, but not doing any armor work for anybody else. Uh, just, you know, just personal, personal armor. Yeah. 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 And um, that application has been more than a year in the oh, running. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, I have been, we haven't done any of the stuff yet, but I've been told that there's going to be, you know, inspections of my storage. There's going to be uh, all sorts of things. When we applied for our license, it was roughly a two year process uh, yeah. from the time that we filed the application to the time that we were actually approved. We went through three different physical inspections. Uh, so, first, what happened was we filled out the paperwork and we submitted the paperwork. Then we had to have all the background checks done. Background checks were done by our local police department as well as by CSIS. So the Canadian Secret Service uh, also gets involved yep. and, and they do their background checks. Once we're cleared of that, we're then interviewed. So the CFO comes down and they actually sit with us and they interview us to discuss what it is we want to do, how we want to go about doing it, what our policies and procedures are going to be, how we're going to deploy and, and how we're going to operate our business. And then the actual physical checks start. So they start coming into the facility and looking for you know, the type of alarm systems that we're going to use and the types of surveillance systems we're going to use and how our armory doors work and how our lockups work and how, you know, it's quite an intricate process and it is about a two-year endeavor from start to finish. Yeah, and I mean, I understand that, you know, they might not, uh, the U.S. might be a little more cavalier about safety rules <laughs> in general, but this was just something else. You know what? I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've, I know a lot of armors from the States. I've worked with a lot of armors from the States, and our protocols and procedures are very, very similar. Um, and, and it's for obvious reason. I mean, everything we do is transparent, and it's done transparently on purpose. We want everybody involved in what we're doing. We want everybody to be comfortable. We want everybody to be aware, and we want everyone to be safe. And so when we deploy a firearm, that firearm stays locked up until literally moments before it's going to be brought out and used in front of the camera. It's kept in a locked up, either in a, a portable lock up safe on the set or it's stored yeah. locked up inside a vehicle where somebody is with that vehicle at all times monitoring it. So that firearm comes out at the last possible second. The firearm is shown and actually held up in front of the entire crew in its locked action open position so that you can see that there's nothing inside the firearm. And it's held up in front of the entire crew so that everybody can see there's nothing inside that gun. We then take it to the actor. And we show the actor that the firearm is clear and that there's nothing inside that firearm. If the firearm is called to shoot blanks in that particular scene, we will then load that firearm right in front of the actor. And we're actually calling out the blank rounds as we're feeding them inside the magazine so that the actor can count them out with us as we're doing it. It's all done so transparent so that there is very little room left for error because at the end of the day, you know, it comes down to human error. That's 99 out of 100 times it's human error. The firearm can malfunction but 99 out of 100 times, it's not the firearm. It's the human error behind it. And so we do as much as possible to eliminate that risk by doing everything open and, and in front of everybody. And in this particular production, none of that happened. 
We're talking about firearms being left on camera carts. We're talking about assistant directors handing firearms to actors, calling the status of that firearm as cold without ever even knowing or checking the status of that firearm before putting it in the actor's hand. I mean, so much went wrong here. It's unfathomable. Yeah, it's just, it's bizarre to, to you know, when you hear about some of this stuff, like, the assist, like what training does this assistant director have to handle a firearm? And none, none. And that's why they don't do it because uh, on a film set, there's only two people qualified to handle that firearm. The armorer that's brought that firearm to the set and is responsible for maintaining it over the course of the film day and the actor that's been trained to deploy that firearm and use it in the scene. And that's it. Nobody else has any business. We have people constantly coming to us at our armaments table, wanting to touch the guns, take pictures of the guns. Hey, can I get a shot holding the gun from my Facebook? You know, and the answer is always a hard no, 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 you cannot. At the end of the day, when we're wrapped and I'm loading my truck, come see me. I'll yeah. let you hold the gun. We'll snap a quick picture and you can go home and slap it all over your Facebook. But while I'm working, I'm here doing a job. And my job is not to get you Facebook photos is to ensure the security and safety of my actor at all times. Yep. So, and I mean, you just have to assume that, you know, you never know what somebody's going to do or why. And so you got to be careful. Nobody touches the, the gun and unless no. it's the talent no. and the armor. And armor. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And uh, thank you to Keanu Samis for the very generous super chat here. And uh, yeah, the other thing that just sh I shake my head at was the reports of uh, accidental discharges on set. Prior to them shutting down the set. Yeah, I know. There was three or four of them before they actually called the show. I couldn't believe that. You know, thank God I have yet, knock on wood, to ever have to face something like that on a film set. We've never had it happen because we maintain our safety and protocol. But if it, God forbid, if that did happen and there was a negligent discharge uh, with a blank round on a film set, uh, all of everything would come to a grinding halt. I mean, that production would come to a hard stop until the assistant producers... The, the executives wouldn't really get involved, but the assistant producers, the showrunners, the directors, the assistant directors, the effects supervisors, and the talent themselves were all comfortable that that was never going to happen again. And that what yeah. happened was for a specific reason and not because of negligence. If negligence came into question, that armament company and the armorer there would be dismissed and they would be replaced before going back to camera. And on this production, they had three or four of those before yeah. somebody even got hurt. It's just mind blowing. It's, you know, I use the example of like you're driving a car and there's no, uh, uh, you've discovered there's no brakes and yeah. suddenly, you know, yeah. you decide you're going to keep going. Right. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I mean, at the end of the day, what a lot of people really need to understand is that a film environment is an extremely fast paced, uh, scenario. You know, we get there, we're usually up at about four 30 in the morning. We're on set by five 30, six o'clock at the latest. We usually have about an hour to prep and our cameras are up by about 7 a.m. And we film straight until we lose the light. So if it's a summer day and we can get sunlight until 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night, we'll shoot straight through until 8, 30, 9 o'clock. If our sun goes down at 5 o'clock, then that's when our day gets called. But yeah. we have to jam as much as possible into that day. And it's an extremely fast-paced environment. You've got 200 people working independently, all to come together at one specific minute, 11.54 or 11.58 when that camera's due to come up. We all have to be ready to all deploy our little tiny portion of that film all at the same time on cue. And it is extremely chaotic and we get pushed very hard by the powers that be. They come yeah. to us and they are extremely demanding and it is our responsibility to back them off and slow them down. I've had producers call me on the radio yelling, where's my talent? Where's my talent? We're in the process of squibbing these guys. So we're putting small pyrotechnic charges all over these actors because they're going to have simulated gunfire. And so we're literally strapping tiny little bombs to these guys. <laughs> and I've got producers coming on the radio yelling at me. That, that where's my actor travel my talent where's my talent camera's ready to go and i've literally come on the radio and said i'm sorry sir but we don't run with bombs strapped to our talent and yeah. then there's silence right <laughs> it's, it, you know it's my job to back these guys down when things get a little too hectic and that's what didn't happen here you know hannah was screaming and complaining that the production was pushing her that they were making her do things she wasn't comfortable doing that she didn't have the support necessary she didn't have the staffing that she required then yeah. it was her responsibility to say stop someone's going to get hurt. And she didn't. And that could be, there could be a lot of different reasons. And I'm not going to speculate as to why it is that she didn't say stop. All we know is that she didn't say stop and we know the end result. And I've heard multiple stories because I reached out to a bunch of armors in Canada and the States uh, when I was looking at this. Because right when this happened, I had a ton of people going, Runkle, we want to comment. And I said, I am not doing that. 
quite right. yet. I want right. to talk to some people. Yeah. And the stories I heard repeatedly were situations of people of armors going. So I was on a movie set that I can't name, and they were pushing <laughs> us to do dangerous things. Yep. And it happens. And we walked like yep. you know yep. there've been in you know armors will get up and just be like. Yep, we oh. do. You we get do. guns. You know? I, I did it. I actually walked off a set in Nova Scotia. Uh, I was I was uh, I was asked to do some very uncomfortable and and very inappropriate things in regards to firearm safety. I discussed my concerns with the director. He told me that if I didn't do it, he could replace me. And I smiled and said, "That's fine, sir. I'll replace myself." And I stepped off the set. And uh, uh, within about thirty seconds, the radios went crazy, and you know the minivans came flying in with all the assistant producers jumping out. And what's going on? What's going on? But <laughs> you know, I have I have walked off a set because I've been asked to do things that that I knew were unsafe. So yeah, we do that. Absolutely, we do that. Yeah, and I mean, every minute of you know of set time on one of these big productions, thousands of be, dollars. Yeah, yeah. So when you're watching a feature film, when you go to the theater and you sit down to watch a feature film, the average movie that you watch costs the production company about forty thousand dollars for every minute of film you're watching. Jeez, that's, yeah. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, when the armor can say, you know, we're shutting everything down, the armor has yeah. got a lot of power. Actually, we have, actually, we have complete power. We have autonomy. When, when the firearms come out, the armor on set actually takes complete control of the set. We have um, the ability to stop the production over top of the director. So if the director calls action, I can call cut. If I see something I don't like, or I see something unsafe, I'll call the cut. Uh, I've gotten dirty looks for it. <laughs> Directors don't like it. But at the end of the day, it's not about the director. It's about my talent. I'm yeah. here to make sure that they go home safe at the end of the day. That's my job. Oh, and somebody's asking, they got your name wrong here. Uh, Seth, are these rules and regulations you talk about only for Canada or the U.S. as well? Uh, no, these rules and regulations are in the States as well. They are absolutely in the U.S. as well. I can't comment as to what the specific laws are, but I do know that they have very strict rules and guidelines in place for, for U.S. productions. Yeah, it's... This is basic safety stuff, and yeah. from what I've heard, the uh, the filming of the crow changed everything in terms of it did, it absolutely did. You know, a lot of people there's a lot of misconception about what happened with Brandon. There's a thousand different stories flying around about what happened with Brandon, and what actually happened for for your listeners that are interested, what actually happened was the day before the accident that took place with Brandon, they were using what are called dummy rounds, and a dummy round is an actual bullet that we've actually taken apart. So we put it inside a bullet puller, and we yank the thing apart, and we take out the copper projectile. We dump all the gunpowder out and all we're left with is a brass casing and a copper projectile. We pop the primer so that there's no actual pyrotechnic left. We seed that copper round back inside that brass casing. So it looks like a functional bullet and that's a dummy round. And we use those in film all the time. Yeah. So what had happened was, was that they had been using those dummy rounds in a 38 special, which was the firearm that unfortunately killed Brandon. And they had been using that gun the day before. And at the end of the day, when the armor unloaded that gun, he didn't check to make sure that he was holding six full dummy rounds in his hand. What he was actually holding in his hand was five full dummy rounds and one brass case. The copper projectile had gotten stuck. It was lodged in the barrel of the gun. So the next day, when they came on set and they loaded blanks into that same gun, that same armor, who didn't check the gun the day before, didn't check it the day after, loaded blanks into the gun. And if you put a projectile, a copper projectile in front of a blank, you've recreated a bullet. Yeah. And so when they pulled that trigger, uh, it hit Brandon right in the chest. And the scene was actually when he climbs up, it's, it's the scene where he uh, finally confronts all the drug dealers and all the bad guys. And, and he's in that room and he climbs up on the table and he does this Jesus Christ pose. And they all stand up from the table and they all open fire on him at the same time. And that was the scene where he actually got killed. And I understand that the actual footage of that scene, they sort of quietly destroyed to make sure it never correct. Out. that's correct yeah there was a lot of rumor that the, if you watch the movie you'll actually see brandon get killed that's absolute garbage that footage was 100 cut from the film and destroyed yeah and that is exactly the right thing to do because 100 uh, yeah yeah it's such a tragic uh scenario there so it was a, it was a, it was an absolute sad waste of life for a very very talented man yeah i mean everybody was thinking that his career was going to explode and he was actually just started yeah, he was just getting started. Well, and when you watch the movie, it uh, it was such a good movie. Yeah. yeah. You know, it would yeah. have been the career launcher movie there. It would have. You know, the hopes for Brandon was that he was going to take over for his dad. You know, yeah. he was supposed to be the next martial art wizard that was going to, you know, carry our film industry for the next 20 years. Uh, and we lost him way too fast, way too young. It was, it was really senseless. 
All right, so uh, I guess let's hear more of Alec Baldwin telling us uh, his uh, side of things. Yeah, I, I've, I got to admit, I find him a little hard to listen to just because I he's making me upset. The thing that really bothered me about listening to Mr. Baldwin, and I've I've actually reviewed a lot of the footage that you're going through now, and and um, and I've been asked to weigh in uh, from a few different places on on my thoughts on this, and. Unfortunately, the thing that really upset me about this was that at the end of the day, we all know that Mr. Baldwin did not intend to hurt anybody. This was not a murder. This was not a conspiracy. This yeah. was a horrible accident. This was a this was an accident gone horribly wrong. And and the sad part was that he couldn't own it. He couldn't say, oh, my God, I killed somebody. I didn't mean to, but I killed somebody. At the end of the day, it all had to be cover your ass. It all had to be what he didn't do or what he, you know, instead of just saying, you know, I don't know how I'm going to live with this. You know, I, our policy and procedure failed and it cost a human life that I'm responsible for. And I don't know how I'm going to live with this. I would have respected him if he had at least owned it, not tried to, you know, cover his ass on the entire thing. And I, I get it from, and you as a lawyer can weigh in on this. You know, you don't want your client to say anything, but, but at the yep. end of the day, he lost a lot of respect, not just from people within our industry, but people worldwide, you know? I mean, the thing is, is I, you know, I get that he's also got to do some PR, but I would be sitting there thinking, first of all, you will do nothing with a police interview. No, no. And, no. you know, second, you can make a public relations statement that basically says, like, uh, we think this is, you know, a tragic accident. We are, you know, and, you know, take some responsibility. Yeah, for he did none of that. The he did none of that. He did none of that. All he did was, was um, basically move immediately into a cover your ass mode. And he started talking about how he didn't pull the trigger. He didn't aim the gun. He didn't, you know, he didn't, have, it was handed to him by this person. He wasn't responsible. It was all just shift the blame, you know, point it in another direction. No pun intended. I apologize for that. Uh, but, yeah. uh, you know, it, it was just, it was, it was absolutely cover your ass instead of just saying, I can't believe this happened. I failed. Our policy and procedure failed. Our industry failed. And it cost a human life. It's really sad. Well, and some of the stuff he's saying here is just not accurate when he says, you know, he's given various statements saying he didn't have his finger on the trigger. And then later there was video release that shows he had his finger on the trigger. Yeah, his finger was okay. absolutely on the trigger. I've been and doing this for a long time. I've been a firearms guy. I was in the military. After I left the military, I've been working in the film industry as an armor for, for decades. And I'll tell you, I have never, ever seen a firearm discharge itself. Yeah. It doesn't happen. A finger has to be on that trigger in order for it to discharge. There's only one scenario where a firearm will discharge itself. And this is absolutely rare and unique, but it requires what's called a trigger modification. So a, a stock trigger has a pull on it of about five to six pounds of pressure. So it takes five or six pounds of pressure for you to make that trigger go click. You can mad, you, can, you know, if people know what they're doing, they have the ability to modify that trigger and you can take that trigger pull down to a half a pound a yeah. pound and literally if you drop a firearm okay with a half a pound trigger pull you take risk of that thing going off on its own yeah. so under very rare condition can a firearm cause that type of a malfunction but under this scenario about what mr baldwin is speaking of with no modification to the firearm i mean we're talking about a live gun here you know we do modify firearms for film and television but those modifications are for functionality not safety Okay, yeah. so so people are under the impression that we make these guns safe so that people aren't going to get hurt. That's not true. These guns are, are not made safe. They're made functional. In other words, a, a semi-automatic firearm uses a gas system in order to cycle the rounds through it. And we need to create back pressure in order for that gun to work. So we block the barrel. Now, yeah. people think we block that barrel so that a bullet isn't going to go through it and it isn't going to hurt anybody. No, that's not why we block the barrel. We block the barrel to create back pressure so we can get the gun to work. The safety doesn't fall on the gun. The safety falls on the armor. And that's what people need to understand. These are real firearms. There's no such thing as a prop gun. I hear this term all the time. Oh, it's, it's a prop gun. There's no such thing as a prop gun. We use real firearms in film and TV. They are yeah. real guns. They are absolutely 100% real guns. And the only time these guns are modified is for function. That's it, period. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes uh, you'll see things that have been modified so that they can't fire at all. But that's... Correct you know, yeah. that's a different sort of thing there. And that's right. We're talking about a gun that's been dewatted at that point. That firearm yeah. has been welded shut. It's completely inoperable. And it's for all intents and purposes, a paperweight. You don't even need a firearms license to own one. Yeah. Uh, they're considered that safe. So you're right. Under that condition, there are, that, that could be referred to as a prop firearm. But at the end of the day, the term prop, like you were mentioning earlier in your talk, prop simply refers to an item. It, yeah. it doesn't refer to the status of that item. It doesn't refer to what that item actually is. 
So when people use the term prop gun, they, they really need to understand that that's, that's not a thing. You know, that doesn't actually exist. We're using real firearms. Yeah. And yeah, a prop gun can mean real gun the same way, you know, prop coffee cup can that's be right. a real coffee cup. That's right. Yep. And the only time that, that productions use replica firearms is on days where that firearm is not going to actually go bang. And the reason for that is a financial decision. Yeah. Okay. When we rent out a firearm, a pistol goes out for about 90 to 95 bucks a day. A, a rifle or an assault rifle or a shotgun will go out for about 150, 165 bucks a day. Whereas a replica firearm will go out for 45 bucks a week. So if a production is not going to be using a firearm that day to actually go bang, but they need their actor to have a, you know that gun in their hand while they're running around the set, or they need that gun in a holster on the actor's hip, yeah. they'll use a replica for those purposes. But any other time, we're talking about a real firearm being babysat by a real armor under real conditions. That's it. It's actually funny because uh, I know some uh, sort of independent filmmakers, like film students, yeah, uh, who were in a situation where they just couldn't afford to get a uh, an ar a film armor, right? And one of them had a firearms license. They actually physically sawed because all they needed was it to be in a holster. So they right. sawed the gun off down at the uh, uh, down basically a little bit past the grip. Yeah. And then stuck that into uh, a thing. Yeah. And they let the police know that they were going to be filming with a, uh, a prop gun. Yep. And yep. The that's the most important thing. Most important thing to do is involve the police department. We do that yep. as professionals. We do that when I'm, when I'm on a film set before I bring out the guns, the very first thing I do is I seek out the onset police officer because we have pay duty officers that are with us for everything we do. And the first thing I do is I seek out the officer and I have him radio back to his station that I'm deploying firearms because yep. the last thing I need is for somebody to drive by the set and see me walking away from one of our lockups carrying a shotgun and down 911 and the police not be aware that I have firearms out on that film set. I don't need that kind of negative response. <laughs> well, and the other thing was uh, the police officer decided he was going to insist that he wanted to check that it was unloaded. Yeah. Which, fair enough. Yep. So he came out and he made the the, the actor take the gun off, you know, off his hip or the officer actually pulled the thing out and it was just the, the grip. Yes. He's like, oh, um, yeah. Yeah. never mind. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, but yeah, it's what the, this whole thing about like, she wasn't supposed to be standing there. I wasn't supposed to point the gun at a person, but she was there. So I decided to just go anyway. Well, you know what? Here's the thing about that. That's where, so, so you know, a lot of people, um, you sort of need to understand when you watch a movie, a lot of times we're trying to, when we make a film, we want to immerse you in that movie for 90 minutes, right? We want to take you out of your real life. If you're an accountant, you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you're a steel worker, whatever it is that you do for a living, we want to take you out of your real world for 90 minutes and we want to put you in our world and make you experience things and make you feel and make you emote and make you enjoy or hate or cry or laugh. We want to, we want to create an environment for you that you can believe. And a lot of ways we do that is by immersing you in the film, by, by involving your participation. So for example, we'll take a firearm, we'll have an actor take a firearm and we'll have him point it directly at the camera so that you as the viewer watching on the screen are seeing that firearm pointed directly at you. And that makes you emote, it makes you feel, right? You don't like it, it makes you uncomfortable. You don't like having a gun pointed at you. You're feeling what that victim or what that other actor or what that other person in the film is supposed to be feeling. So we're trying to get your participation. So it's not uncommon that we would have a scene where, where an actor would actually point a firearm directly at a camera. Um, that's not that bizarre. What's bizarre is the fact that they were rehearsing, which is not bizarre in itself. I mean, we, we rehearsed three or four times before we actually turned the cameras on. But what's really bizarre is that they even had the firearm for the rehearsal. Yeah. I mean, nine out of 10 times, the actors I work with don't even use the firearm when they're rehearsing. You know, if, if, if this was my set and I had my actor in that pew where Mr. Baldwin was sitting, there would be no reason for him to have the firearm in his hand. He would make the motion and he would have, you know, his finger and his thumb pointed out as if he had a gun in his hand, but the firearm would not actually be in his hand. He doesn't need it for the rehearsal. Yeah. So, oh, well, I don't know how to do this. Okay, Mr. Baldwin, here's a banana. Right. You exactly. Know? Yeah. We don't, we, we, the only, like I said before, the only time that firearm comes out of its lockbox is seconds before that camera turns on. We do not need it for rehearsal. So the fact that there was a firearm involved in the rehearsal, the fact that there was a loaded firearm involved in the rehearsal, the fact that the firearm was oh. left sitting on a camera cart, it was picked up by an assistant director, it was called cold when there was no status check performed on the firearm, the fact that Mr. Baldwin accepted the firearm from an AD, he should have absolutely put his hands up and said, I'm sorry, but I'm not taking that from you. Where's my armor? 
Yeah. Right. So, I mean, it failed A, B, C, and D failed straight across the alphabet on this one. Well, and there were rumors that people were using these guns in off time for target shooting. Yeah, there was talk that they were setting up pop cans after hours on the fences and they were going out back to, to target shoot. We never got confirmation on that. Um, okay. You know, the sheriff's department weighed in and they'd also never had anybody actually formally come forward and say, yes, that happened. So the best okay. of my knowledge, that's conjecture. Because that was just horrifying. <laughs> that's Yeah, if that actually happened, these guys should have been shut down long before the accident. Yeah, I mean, right. these are things that, you know, it's just like, yeah, I've, I've, I've often had people come to me and say, Hey, listen, I'd love to shoot those guns. And I say to them, you know what? We wrap this movie in three weeks. Here's my card. Call me and uh, I'll get you to come by the shop and, and, you know, we'll grab a couple of guns and we'll head up to the range together and I'll, I'll let you try out some of our toys. Uh, that's, that's not uncommon. We do that all the time, but while the movie's going on, absolutely not hard. No. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah, because while that movie is going on, this is a working gun, basically. That's right. And yeah. it cannot, yeah. under any circumstances, come near, a, you know, a cartridge. And not, and there's, there's other, you know, there's some selfish reason to this too. Uh, and and I'll be totally honest with you. At the end of the day, if you have an accident in this industry, you're done. Yeah, you're finished. If you are responsible for an actor being injured in this business, <laughs> you better go find another job because nobody is going to put you on their film set ever again. And so part of what I do is not just to ensure the safety and security of my talent, but it's also to ensure that I have a job tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, you know, I need to make sure that not only are my actors safe, but that I get to come back to work too. So, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons that we do what we do and, and, and some of it is selfish and some of it is selfless, but the policies and procedures are there for a reason. And we do not, uh, you know, uh, drift from those policies and procedures whatsoever. I, I have been doing this a long time and I can say that the, the, the number one reason that, I've yet to have an accident, knock on wood, uh, yeah. is because of the fact that I recognize the severity of what would happen if I had an accident. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, uh, losing your career is is one thing, but I mean, the liability and the... Oh, uh, our, our insurance policy is $18,000 a year to ensure that, uh, <laughs> to ensure that should something ever happen, we're covered. $18,000 a year, we have to pay out to, for, for that policy. Well, and the other thing is just, and this is something that people don't often think about when they talk about like defensive shooting and so forth, which is that uh, uh, it's a really big deal if you are in some way connected or responsible for uh, for somebody's death. A hundred percent. Not only on a liability aspect, but you have to live with that for the rest of your life. You're yeah. going to have to go to sleep every night knowing that there's a wife without a husband, there's a child without a parent. There's a parent without a kid because of something that you were directly responsible for. And yep. that's a, that's a really tough pill to swallow. You're not going to survive that one with, uh, with all of your senses intact. Well, and you may not, you know, survive at all. There's actually details on when people are cleared in tr like traffic fatalities, mm -hmm. you know, so the police investigate and they say, you did nothing wrong. You know, somebody, um, you know, ran like a kid ran out after a ball and there was nothing you could do because this kid just comes right, right. shooting out from behind a parked car, um, you know, on the highway where the kid had no business being. Um, people actually have a very high fatality rate after that. It's tough. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's, uh, yeah. And I mean, the other thing is, you know, this guy sort of, Baldwin's portraying like he's just like oh well I'm just the the dumb actor and whatever it's like you're also the producer not just the producer but you know what I, I listen at the end of the day everybody in our business wants to cut this guy slack all right we yeah. do we, we, we want to be able to cut him slack and I can't no matter what I do I always fall back to the same thing and that is for 20 years I've been watching this man make movies I've been a fan of some of his movies going back 20 years ago Hunt for Red October loved it oh loved that movie Right. And, and so, I mean, I've been watching this guy dance around the silver screen with firearms for 20 years. He knows our rules. He knows our policies and procedures. He's been involved with them. He's worked with us hand to hand. You know, I can't cut this guy slack as much as I want to. I can't, you know what you're doing. You know, the rules, you know why we do what we do and you just failed. Yeah. That's it's, it. it's not like he's a sort of bright eyed extra brought no, up no, the first no, time. No, no. You no. know, or something like that. It's, no, this is a seasoned veteran that knew what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because I actually saw a casting call for veterans uh, just or for, uh, sorry, for uh, extras recently. Mm -hmm. And they noted that it because it involved carrying but not drawing a firearm, mm -hmm. 
because mm-hmm. uh, they wanted extra. And they said, basically, you can't do this unless you've got firearm experience. And I'm going, mm-hmm. OK, like yeah. they wanted they wanted to make sure that was lined up. And I was going, huh. you know, we've we had a real knee jerk reaction after the Baldwin incident. Um, you know, we had some productions that that said, that's it. We're never going to bring another firearm onto our film sets ever again. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that was the sort of the initial knee jerk reaction. We had a few different productions that said that. And at the end of the day, it's not about the firearm. OK, that's I mean, you know, it's yeah. it's not about the gun. And that rolls back to everything. You know, it's it's not about the device itself. It's about the person standing behind the device. And and so once we made it clear that this was not a Canadian problem and I say that selfishly, you know, but we don't this type of stuff doesn't happen in Canada. We don't have these types of accidents because we have such strict policy and procedure and because we have oversight from the chief firearms office of Ontario, from the RCMP, from the local police departments. We have people watching to make sure what we're doing is safe and secure and proper and protocol and and uh, we just don't we just don't make these mistakes here in Canada. The states, like you mentioned, they there's they're a little more lax, a little more comfortable, and there's more risk of uh, you know of of that type of accident occurring. But in Canada, it's not an issue. So that initial knee jerk reaction that we saw, where production companies were saying, "No, no, we're never going to do this again," that that fell by the wayside very quickly. And uh, you know, to be honest with you, a lot of people will say, "Why do you use real guns in movies? What's the point?" Why can't you just use a plastic toy gun? Why can't you use a metal replica and just use a computer CGI solution to get that flash that we all need? And and it's because as much as we want you to emote while you're watching this movie, as much as we want you to feel involved in it, we need to do that same thing with our talent. If I put a plastic gun in my talent's hand and tell him to pretend to make it go bang, you're going to see a very different uh, delivery than if I put a real firearm in that actor's hand, loaded with blanks, and pulled and started pulling the trigger. He's going to wince. He's going to squint. He's going to shy away from the gun when it goes bang. You're going to see real reaction. Whereas if he's if he's cheating it, you're going to tell the difference. And and that's something that is is commonly seen in film. And because of that, we try and stay away from the replica stuff. We try and get that real, you know, that real reaction. So when a lot of people ask that question, why do you guys reuse real guns? That's why we're trying to get the actors to really emote for us. And yeah, it's because I'm familiar with firearms and so forth. Uh, I can tell a, like there's a lot of movies where I just sit in there and uh, my wife hates this when I'm sitting there watching a movie and I'm just like airsoft. And she's like, can you watch the movie? I'm like, no, because that's an airsoft gun right there. Yep. She's like, yep. How can you tell I'm like, well, uh, when he turns it this way, I can see the fueling port. Uh, when he, you know, and I can see the brass sleeve down the barrel, like this is just an off the shelf airsoft gun. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And that does happen. And those are, and that's when I was mentioning on days where we don't have the guns actually going bang and the productions have brought in replicas. A lot of times what they'll use are they'll, they'll use airsoft replicas. Uh, yeah. and, and, and it's up to the armaments house to get in there with some black paint and cover that brass ring you're talking about. It's up to the armaments house to swap out that magazine so that you don't see that little charging wheel on the bottom of the airsoft mag. Yeah, uh, you know, as some armaments houses do it, they pay attention to detail. Others don't, and so when you catch it in a film, that's that's the armaments house that that you know just sort of let let a little bit of detail slide. Yeah, and I I suspect that often it's they're just like ah, it's no big deal. You know, the people are the producers and so forth, and it's a big deal. But uh, let's uh, sort of continue on. With- yeah, let's get back to Mr. Baldwin's video. We're monopolizing this whole thing. I feel badly. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> You were not at the cameraman, but you had identified there were two people there. Can you tell me who those people were? My recollection is that the operator was there. He's the steady cam operator. Okay. He's a man who there's either a camera on sticks that's stationary, okay. or there's a man who operates the steady cam that moves. The camera operator was there behind the camera, and she was to his right. And who is she? That's what I'm going to Helena, the, the cinematographer. Okay. The camera director. And she was right next to the cameraman. She was to his right, to my left. And who was behind her? Joel. And he is? The director of the movie. Okay. Can you recall who exactly was inside at the time no. of the incident? Uh, or uh, anyone Dave, else? Dave Halls. Halls. Okay. The first AD. He's in charge of the crew. The first assistant director is the man who's like the foreman of the set. He's in charge of all the grips, all the, all the crew. Okay. Electric, cable. Do you know his name? Dave Wall. Dave Halls. Okay. Uh, Dave Halls is always there. 
uh, uh, Helena, Joel, me, the operator, an assistant camera person, the script supervisor, the woman who sits in the corner in some strategic position to take notes on all the action of the take so you can match. If one day you're doing a scene, you sit there and go, what is your first name? Samantha. So like, Samantha, you know, it's really important that you and I uh, drink, 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 uh, get together and talk about that case. You drank, when did you, she makes notes, so we match every take. That's called continuity. That woman who does continuity, she's always there watching. She was in the room. Okay. She's an older woman, like in her 60s, maybe. Um, um, you know, that color, blonde hair, maybe, or brown hair. But she, I forget her name, but she is, so there's a group of people that are always there for every shot, even if you're in a kind of a cramped interior. This set of this church is not large, so then the rest of the crew is outside. In that side was a limited number of people, maybe eight. Nine, I don't remember, but I, I know that every time they do a shot, those people are always on the set. Camera, assistant camera, cinematographer, director, first AD, script. Okay, so not too many. Very few. Do you think that any part of this incident that occurred was intentional? Oh, I, I can only say this, which is, and, and it was to me. To place a bullet and position a bullet that is a live round, to make sure that that bullet is in the chamber, if I were to squeeze the trigger in a rehearsal that that bullet came out, someone has to have extraordinary access to that weapon to do that. I can't imagine somebody walked around with a round that was a 45 caliber round. So you see other people on the set were speculating that if it was a 45 caliber round, she'd be dead. It would have blown a big hole in her. Oh. I mean, first of all, it was a yes or no question, dude. Hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. And like, why is he going off into this conspiracy kind of? I don't know. To make sure that the bullet was positioned inside the chamber, so that when I pulled the trigger, it's a crazy coincidence. It's, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah, nonsense. it's it's just the gun is loaded. It's like yep. this is how accidents yeah. happen. Yeah. And when he you starts, know, I I don't know whether your viewers are aware of this, but do, do you guys know that when they when the sheriff's department came to the set? and they seized everything that was involved. What they took were the clothes that Mr. Baldwin was wearing because they were covered in blood. They took the firearm that was involved in the incident. They then went with the armor to the lockup vehicle, which was an RV that was pointed parked on the side of the set. They seized the rest of the firearms that were in the trailer and they took an ammo can. When they inspected that ammo can, what they found inside was a mix of three different types of rounds. They found dummy rounds, like I was mentioning before, which was a real bullet that's been pulled apart and made inert. They found blanks and live rounds all mixed together inside that same ammo can. Okay. So he's sitting here talking about how, well, you know, it's really uh, interesting how that one bullet made it inside the right chamber. You know, dude, at the end of the day, it could have been in the third chamber. It could have been in the second chamber. It could have never even made it into the gun. It's because somebody reached into that box and just grabbed a handful of rounds and stuck them in the gun. Nobody checked. Yeah, and I mean, if you've got mixed ammo like that, yeah, yeah, it's time to just throw the whole thing out. You know, you can't go certain back through it. Like, <sighs> yeah, it's 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 the fact that there was. I mean, like we said before, the fact that there was even live rounds on that set is is beyond fathomable but the fact that those live rounds were mixed in an ammo can with blank rounds and dummy bullets all mixed yeah. together not even like they were in separate boxes categorized i mean they were just loosely dumped into an ammo can all mixed together there's no way for that to happen that isn't no. crazy no that's ask that's asking for somebody to get shot right that's yeah. you're just you're asking for it so Anyway, I digress. Yeah, I mean, the only time I could see that is if you had, like, a disposal bin. Like, all of this is to be destroyed. Uh, but Yeah, sure, yeah. But the fact that, it, I mean, but again, it roll, we roll right back to the same thing. The fact that there was even a live round on that set in the first place. Oh, yeah. there There is no explanation for a no. live round being on that set that isn't somebody screwed up in ways that should have them paying a ton of money. Not just uh, a ton of money. They should, they, should, they should be in jail. My personal opinion is that there's there's somebody here. Th listen, there's a kid that's going to grow up without a mom. Yeah. There's a, there's a husband who's now going to who's now a, a widower in his thirties. Um, yeah. You know, this is there's tragedy all over this place, and to think that nobody is going to be held liable for this, that somebody isn't going to pay the ultimate price and go to jail, uh, I'm not comfortable with that. 
and you know, um, the one in her lawsuit uh, had the armor had indicated that she was uh, suing because uh, they're like, oh, they provided me, you know, uh, ammunition that had live cartridges put in it. That's right. Yeah. I mean, let's say I am the armor on a film set. And of course, as I've said before, I'm not qualified to do that. But if I found a single live cartridge in the dummy that I bought, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it would be like production needs to stop. I know that this is costing a ton of money, but yeah. somebody will die. Yeah, that's right. Every yeah. single dummy that we have needs to either be manually checked individually or just throw everything out and get new ones. That's right. When the like, production company was questioned about this, they said that they thought it was possible that the company that had manufactured their blanks had inadvertently and accidentally mixed live rounds in with the blanks. I doubt that. I can tell you firm for all the years I've been doing this, I have never opened a box of blanks and found a real bullet. Never, yeah. never. So yeah, it, anyway. it's, it's so unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's the same thing. That's their entire business. And even just a report of, you know, if you guys ordered a box like that and you circulated, listen, we got, you know, in a box of 20 cartridges, we got 19 dummies and one live cartridge. Yeah, yeah. Like once that news gets around, nobody is going back to that tummy manufacturer. No, 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 no. And to yeah. be honest with you, the majority of the large armament houses, we press our own blanks. Yeah. You know, we make our own ammunition and we do that for a couple of reasons. One, we want to ensure that it's safe and that it's good. We know who manufactured it because it was us. Yeah. You know? And the other reason we do it is because it's cost effective. So um, it's a lot cheaper for us to manufacture our own blank rounds than for us to purchase them. So uh, again, th if this person is blaming a manufacturer, it takes me right back to the same thing. This is an experience. This is negligence. This is, you know. It's ridiculous. But yeah, uh, yeah let's keep going here. Let's keep going. Yeah. And so we're wondering, was the projectile that went in or some foreign material stuck and it was an accident, it was a flash round, and something came out of the barrel? They didn't check. They always check. But... But do you check? But to your experience with these armors... I've never heard of anything like this in my life, ever. Okay. I've never heard of a projectile coming out of a prop gun that went through a there person's we body, and we thought her being a smaller woman. The, the, the bullet went in here, I'm told, went in here, came out here, her shoulder or whatever, and went into his body and very, I've never heard of that in my life. I don't know of any projectile with a gun in a flash prop gun that could accomplish that. Again, with the flash now, prop gun. Now, if somebody gun. put yeah. a live round in there accidentally, see, a very important question for Hannah is, do you, have you ever commingled live rounds with theatrical rounds in your kit? Because you're forbidden to do that. But I mean, According he had to, to have known that he's the, the producer of the set. Yeah. Been... You're not allowed to do that because of the fear of what will happen that you commingle. So whether someone accidentally, and I can't even imagine this, deliberately placed a live round in that gun, uh, I've, never, I've never heard of that in my life. And I, I don't know anything about what happened, but all I know is when I... See, see, the other thing about this is in a live round, you have a recoil, mm -hmm. usually. When I shot that gun and it went off, I didn't shoot it when it went off, um, I didn't intend for it to, <laughs> to, 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 to happen. Yeah. When that happened is, it, it always, I've always told, but because I'm not a gun person, I don't own a gun. They've always told me they asked me to simulate the recoil. When I shoot the Colt, which is a big gun, 45 caliber bullet, they always teach me when we should be go action. I go, get back here, boom, and they make me take my hand and go, boom, and have the kick. Because mm -hmm. there's no kick in a flash round. Okay. And when I this time, I don't recall there being any kick either. That's important. Okay. Are you ex I know so this guy has like no firearm experience? It's clear because you can't necessarily estimate the amount of you know of felt recoil just by looking at the gun. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, I always give the example of uh, you remember Men in Black, mm -hmm. and you know, Will Smith's get character gets handed the tiny little gun. That's right, that's right. Yeah, the cricket. And, you know, I always warn people, I'm like remember that scene in the movie because when you're thinking about recoil often that tiny little lightweight gun yep. is the one that's going to hurt you whereas yep. that big heavy gun might be pretty comfortable to shoot well the big heavy gun has got the weight it's going to absorb really a lot of the recoil so, yeah yeah and he might have known that if he was a person who actually shoots guns as opposed to you know a guy who appears in movies well you know what's what i find interesting here is when when he's for this specific part of his interview where he's chiming in here about about the firearm itself he keeps referring to it as a prop gun a yeah. flash gun 
I, I don't know what he's talking about because that there, there is again, no such thing. Um, you know, this was a real Colt 45 that was being used. It yep. was, uh, because of the fact that it's a, a, a revolver, there's no modification that needs to be made to this particular fire. It can shoot blank rounds and live rounds out of the same firing with no modification. So yep. there would be a, no mods done to this firing whatsoever. So we're talking about a live Colt 45 here. Uh, I don't know what this, the, the prop gun that he's talking about. I don't understand the, the flash gun that he's talking about. Uh, so, so you might be right in saying that he may not have the experience, uh, as he can't even get the terminology right. And just for the chat, the reason why the semi-automatics might be uh, modified and the revolver not, uh, the semi-automatic, in order for the action to cycle, it relies on the gas. That's right. And normally, when there's when it's pushing a projectile, there's a fair bit of sort of that gas getting pushed back in the gun. But if it's all going out the front with no projectile blocking it, uh, what you'll get is you fire the gun and the action just sort of goes... And That's then right. just, there's nothing to cycle that next round into place. So they have to narrow the the barrel or sometimes block it entirely so that there's enough gas to make that cycle. That's right. But the revolver doesn't cycle based on, on the gas at all. It cycles based on the pull of your finger. It's mechanical. Yeah. So you don't need to do anything to it. So as mentioned, they don't. Because why would you start messing around with the gun if you don't That's have right. to? That's right. So, yeah. Yeah, it's... All right, it, it's just very interesting here how you know when, when they start asking these direct questions about the gun and he starts throwing around this really bizarre terminology and i'm confused by that because he i mean listen the actors i work with they're not firearm experts uh, a lot of them aren't even comfortable with firearms but they know they have an understanding they know that this is a real gun they know that there's no such thing as a prop gun they know that we're using blanks or we're not using anything today that this gun is going to be cold for the day or you know they're, they're fully aware they understand they know the terminology uh, he's talking here terminology that sounds like it's day one on a film set. Yep. So I, I'm not I'm not exactly sure what to make of that. So there's a question here. Somebody's saying if we admit that Baldwin has no firearm experience and that he's just a guy who makes movies, then how can be he be held to a higher standard of gun safety than a licensed professional? Because he's in, the one that had it in his hand. In law, there's actually you know there's actually certain kinds of activities that are so hazardous that you can't use ignorance as a defense. Right. Uh, firearm handling is one of those. Careless handling of a firearm. You can't say, listen, I don't know about guns, so I need to be held to a lesser standard. In fact, uh, the law will say, listen, if you don't know anything about guns, then the proper thing for you to do was to not handle that gun at all. Yes. Uh, and, you know, if he's saying that he's so ignorant that he can't... Uh, take these necessary steps then he shouldn't have touched the gun um yep. that's i mean yeah yep. that's kind yeah, you're, of you're absolutely right that's 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 it in its entirety if you want to cut this thing down to its core that's it he sh yep. sh should not have touched the gun period yeah and um uh, one armor told me a story basically of a person on a movie set whose character was originally designed to use a gun and they couldn't take it seriously like they put you know the gun in their hand and they're like oh and waving it around and the armor was just like nope and basically went to the people running the, the show and said no gun not you know that person and so they had to actually rewrite the character to use a different weapon entirely i believe it yeah, and it was just it. like because this actor can't be trusted with with a fire I've, yeah i've had situations on sets where i've spent you know excessive amount of time working with one specific talent or or working with the one background actor or one extra and they just couldn't get it you know it didn't matter how i broke it down it didn't matter how i explained it or how i baby stepped them through the process they just couldn't get a grip on it to the point where i felt that they were safe with this thing and so i would say you know what why don't we just let me make a few changes here why don't we shift you and move you over here and uh we're gonna get you to run by the back of the car instead and, and you know we'll get you to do that for us we, we just find another purpose uh yeah. and we just alleviate the concern so well and the other thing and somebody in chat mentioned this is that he spent all this time bragging about all of his gun knowledge mm -hmm. in this interview and you know you can't play that both ways either you're this you know, seasoned expert who should know better, which frankly, I think he, you know, he should, he is in a position where he should know better, or you're the, you know, the, the naive who's walking out there who should still know better. And, you know, you should actually want to get some training on that. You know, when we, when we first come in contact with our talent on a film, 
um, and, and we're going to be working with them when it comes to discharging blank fire. We go to that actor very privately before they're ever in front of the camera. So if it's, you know, if camera's up for 11 o'clock, they're due in front of the camera for 11 at 9 a.m. I'll have uh, an assistant direct me, or an assistant director escort me to their trailer. I'll knock on the trailer door. I'll qu quietly step inside and very privately, we will go through the firearm together. And we do that because I don't want to embarrass them on the day in front of talent or, or in front of crew if they don't know how to use the firearm or if they're not comfortable with it. We address all this stuff long before they ever get to the ever get to the actual set. So yeah. uh, I can tell you that Mr. Baldwin has had that same experience numerous times from numerous different armors he's worked with over the course of his career. And yeah. for him to say at this point that he doesn't know what he's doing with a firearm after all the movies that I, I have seen him in and that I, I, I mean, I know what happens behind the scenes. I know the amount of work that goes into getting these guys comfortable with a gun. I can tell you, he knows what he's doing. He, he knows what he's doing. Well, and the other thing is that there's actors who go the further step to really actually make sure they know what they're doing. Yes. Um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, as much as he's got sort of a reputation as kind of a meathead, uh, <laughs> when he got the role in Terminator, what did he do? He went and trained the hell out of, you know, firearm handling mm -hmm. so that he knew what, and, you know, so look that he at, knew what that was about. Look at Keanu Reeves. Everyone's raving about Keanu oh. Reeves and John Wick, right? The guy's a professional three-gun competitor. Well, apparently he started three-gun to do John Wick is what That's I've right. heard. That's correct, yeah. And I've watched his three gun videos and I'm just it's like, unbelievable. The guy shit. is fabulous behind the trigger. He absolutely knows what he's doing. His handling is, is top notch. His safety is top notch. His accuracy is top notch. I mean, this guy put in the time. He really put in the time. I would, yeah, I would love to, uh, like I shoot some three gun. I would love to shoot around with Keanu. Just you and me both. Oh, <laughs> it like, the the thing is, like I see somebody asking what is three gun? It's uh, a dynamic shooting, so you have to move and engage targets. You have to decide how you're going to engage them. So there's a, a thoughtfulness aspect to it. And you're and, using three guns. And you're using three guns: handgun, rifle, shotgun. Shotgun. That's right. So you have to be good with all three different, you know, guns, and it's really, you know, it's challenging. Yeah. And, you know, I've put some video up of me doing three gun and I will tell you, you can see all the places where it's just like where I fumble, where I hesitate, where I, you know, need to catch my breath, where I need to do all of this stuff. Um, watching Keanu's footage, he's just seamless. It's like watching a dolphin swim. Yeah, he's smooth. He's really smooth. And I'm just like, he's like what everybody imagines that they will be like in their head yeah. and, right. <laughs> and totally isn't for, yeah. you know, I've seen people who've been doing three gun for, you know, literally decades that are not as good are not nearly. As yeah. Good. Yeah. No, the guy's a natural. He, I mean, but you know, he put in the time he, when Ke and Keanu's known for this, he's known in our industry for doing this. He commits to his character like nobody. I mean, oh, this I, guy puts in the research, he puts in the time. He'll spend 16, 18 hours a day in training, getting ready for a character, whether it's educational, whether it's physical, whatever it is that he's doing. But he will literally commit 18 hours a day for six months, nine months, 12 months before he has to get in front of a camera. Uh, the guy is a true professional. Yeah, I just, i super impressed by that video. Yeah. Um, there's another video that actually kind of impresses me with Will Smith. And I've heard that it might be staged, but uh, I don't know. Um, what is it? Will Smith is sitting there and they're discussing things and there's a bunch of firearms and this guy goes and picks one up off the table mm -hmm. and starts to turn with it. Will Smith sort of grabs his hand and pushes it down and clears the gun and sets it down. He's like, these are guns, dude. Like, chill. yeah, you know what? It wouldn't surprise me if that actually happened. That wouldn't surprise me. Uh, you know, actors are very conscious on a film set of what's happening around them. They really are. Don't for one second think that they're not fully aware of what's going on at all times around them. And uh, a lot of them are not comfortable with firearms. They're really not. They know how to use one. Uh, they've been involved in numerous productions where they've, they, they, they themselves have had to carry one, but they don't like them. They don't like guns. They're not, they're not comfortable with it. And so when there's one out in front of them or when there's, you know, armors walking around with firearms or when there's firearms involved, they're usually pretty much uh, in the know of what's, what's happening. Yeah. So that wouldn't surprise me if that actually did happen. I, I mean, there's this sort of gap in knowledge between people who actually pay some attention to what firearm safety is about and what firearm handling is about yep. um, versus yep. people who just um, 
who just don't care and expect that everyone else around them is going to be responsible for safety. Right. Um, which to my mind seems like getting on the highway and saying, well, everyone else knows how to drive. So it's okay <laughs> if I don't. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Anyways, back to the video. Yes. And you said you don't own a gun, but are you experienced with shooting guns? Only as much as an actress have to be experienced. Okay. Which yeah. is normally not. Really well, I mean, if you do a movie, safety with weapons is, is primary. You go off with people. You go off with armaments people to ranges. I've gone to ranges in Arizona where we shot a lot of guns in a movie many years ago. And uh, you go to a range and you shoot for a few hours. And they teach you how to shoot shotguns, uh, uh, warfare, uh, uh, different you know, little small guns, uh, James Bond guns, big guns, Uzis, machine guns. Whatever you're using, they make you go and rehearse for hours, like a whole day. Okay. Yeah, well, they're very yeah, safety they're conscious, and, as they have been here. They've been very safety conscious here throughout. That's what puzzles me. Well, we didn't have any. Yeah, and I guess that's where... So how can he say this when there yes, were right. multiple unintentional discharges? Right, so on one side that? he's saying, you know, I'm not a professional. On the other side he's saying, yeah, they send us out for training that takes days. Well, <laughs> and I sort of like, oh, you spent several hours training. Great. Yeah. I do that for giggles on, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, he's but what he's doing here is, is you know, he's he's um, playing the left left hand and right hand at the same time, you know. Yeah, and, and that's that's what I find frustrating. On one side of the coin, he's saying, "Well, you know, uh, the flash gun, the prop gun." He's making reference to stuff that doesn't exist. He's using incorrect terminology. He's saying he doesn't have experience. He doesn't know. Then on the other side of the coin, he's telling you, "Oh yeah, yeah. When we're making a movie, they send us out for you know for a whole day, and they, they'll give us Uzis and all these different guns, and we'll shoot for hours and hours." I mean, which is it? Well, the thing is, depending on how they ask the question is how he responds to defend against what the, you know, the suggestion he's hearing in their voices. Mm. So when they, when he hears them saying, oh, um, you know, were you inexperienced? He's like, no, no, I'm super experienced. And they go, oh, well, were you maybe at fault somehow? He's like, no, no, I'm totally clueless. It's other right. people's. And he he can't really keep his story straight. He's uh, he's just kind of following their lead and mm. defending against it. Now, the other thing is that um, if these were investigators who were giving him more grief, and maybe we'll see that towards the end of it, uh, that's a place where they'd start hammering him. But given that they haven't charged him, I'm going to guess that they don't actually get to that stage. I'm going to guess that he probably gets a celebrity pass on getting the full uh, interview press here. Yeah, I would so. tend to agree. Yeah. All right, let's keep going here. Like the question that I'm trying to get out is, do you think someone would deliberately do this? I can't imagine who would. Okay. Now, people have said, you know, that six people got fired from the crew yesterday because they said that they do the dude. union. Yeah. I don't want to get into a long diatribe about this, but the union, the International Association of Theatrical Stage Employees, IATSE is their name. IATSE is the union that controls all the actors. The Directors Guild controls the director, the Screen Actors Guild controls the but all of the crew are controlled by a contract in which those people voted to go on strike against the major studios, the major networks, the major streaming services, but not the independent film community. In fact, the IATSE rep for the New Mexico contract, because every state has different contracts, was instructed by his bosses in LA to don't go on strike. The strike is against the majors, not against the indie people. And in the indie films, there's six different tiers, I believe, in terms of the contract, how much they're paid. Okay. So a bunch of people on the set walked off anyway, even though they were told not to, to, to strike. They, they struck and they left. And that was yesterday. That was yesterday. That was their last day. Yeah, and the okay. question becomes, yeah. I mean, somebody said, would, did, would one of them do? I, I, don't, I don't even know. I, I have no idea. I have no, no idea. wasn't that so, actually? And I would that was mentioned to me is that it sounded like it was most of the camera crew that walked off that yes. um, yesterday and quit. And maybe it, they got fired because they walked off. Um, so the other thing is that the two major people, like you said, the director, um, those are the ones who got hurt. So with the camera crew and them quitting and then your director getting injured as well as um, Helena, that, 
you don't think there's anybody that had any anger towards them or anything that would want to I don't know the details. I know that one guy, whose name I'm forgetting, he was a very heavy set guy. Okay. He was a very, and lovely to me. And he walked up to me and he said, thank you for the things you posted on social media in support of the IATSE strike. And he said, I'd like to talk to you privately. He, goes, he said, because I've got some of my guys sleeping in their car. Mm -hmm. Many of the crew here, because they're shooting in Albuquerque, Albuquerque yeah. based, they live there. So the drive time, uh, it, it's kind of common knowledge in the business that the, uh, the unions in New Mexico signed very bad deals in order to attract movie shooting here. They wanted to grow the, the, the crew uh, uh, base here. So they signed the deal that wasn't a good deal when I gave them a 60 mile commute radi radius. So that means if you live within 60 miles of the set, mm -hmm. you come to work and you don't get paid any, you don't have to drive home, they don't hotel you. They don't know in New York it's 30 miles and they have to put you up in a hotel and give you gas money and money. there's a whole other complicated contract. In the in the more um, expensive markets, nobody cares. Here, this guy was telling me. He turned to me. He goes, "My guys are sleeping in their car." Now I went to the AD and the producers, and I asked him, "What's up with that?" He said, "They knew what the contract was. We signed the IATSE contract in New Mexico, and then in the middle of shooting, they decided they wanted to rewrite their deal. They said, put us up in hotels. Now, if you put the camera crew up in a hotel, all the other crafts are going to ask you to put them in a hotel. We don't have the budget for that. Mm. That could be seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars. You know what I mean? Who was that man? Who Do you? The one you said that I forget, like I said, I forget his name. Okay. But anybody there can tell you who the big heavy set guy was who was on the crew that quit yesterday. He didn't come to work today. I see people but my point is that he's trying to if I'm standing there in a rehearsal, they're letting him talk. I'm thinking to myself, could someone actually believe that in a rehearsal I would actually aim the gun and hit those two people? That's far fetched. Or do they want just somebody to get hit? Or I keep telling myself, more likely, was it an accident? But it was a large quarter load is makes noise, but it's like kind of a puff compared. But a half load could shoot a projectile if something was stuck in the barrel. And like I said, the thing that is I think going to answer all your questions is what's in Joel's shoulder? Mm -hmm. Is it a rock or is it a bullet? Uh, I could actually show that to you. What? What was in his shoulder? We did, did they take it out? So you've been on set for so many years, like you said. You have you ever seen? You you said you've never seen anything come out before. I've so never seen. You, no, I've never seen a projectile come out. No, right. No. So, but so, do you know what the bullets look like? Though? Would it have looked something like this if anything did ever come out of something? Okay. No, 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 okay. So, okay. Let's try to check a little bit. Let me say this to you. Hold That's on. a bullet. <laughs> That's a bullet. Right. So as I suspected, somebody put a live round in the gun. If that's a bullet that was pulled out of his shoulder, then someone loaded a live round into the gun I was holding. Now, this is some bad police interrogation because they would have had that picture before. Like, there's no way that they got this midway through. And this, like, they're bringing in Baldwin for an interrogation. Um, and they're actually, like, it looks like they're actually asking him what this is. Now, it could be that they're giving him a possibility to lie like a chance to lie about this, but, you know, why would he? He's got no reason to do so. Um, I think that they just don't know any of the film stuff. So, yeah, uh, this is not great for any of them involved. But, uh, yeah. And, you know, this is another sort of useful point if you're ever in an interrogation. The police can have all sorts of knowledge that they don't have to tell you right away. Um, so that's uh, lots of people are surprised by that in interrogations because they'll start telling a story and the uh, the officer will be like, oh, but we already know this. And they're like, oh, uh, yeah, you don't know what they know and you don't know that what they know that's actually wrong. Because sometimes that, you know, sometimes that is a thing, too, where the officers... Uh, think they know something, but it's incorrect. So now, let me ask you, did you see the rounds that were in the gun? No. Have you seen, throughout the whole time on set, have you seen what they look like? I've watched her load and reload the gun many times, many times. Have you seen the bullets and stuff? Well, meaning yes, meaning you see um, sometimes the head, it's the casing, and the head is a pinched, it almost looks like a dumpling. 
You just close at the top. There is no piece. And you put the cosmetic round in when you know you're going to see. If I hold the gun, if I say to you, what is your first name again? Alex. If I say to you, Alex, don't you move a muscle, darling. I'm going to blow you. And you anyway, the camera shoots me. You want to see the material in the cylinder. The cosmetic clay-based non-bullet round. So can you describe to me what those clay-based rounds look like? Except that they're often actually they look like a bullet. Standard okay. bullets. With they're, they're, they're gray. They're they're exactly like a bullet. brass head and they have a brass base packed with something I'm assuming. And, the, uh, um, and then the, uh, the heads look like a bullet. So cosmetically, you see that in the cylinder. The other rounds you shoot have a, it's the, it's the base with the pin. This comes up and this comes up. And it's a round like this. And if you look at the top, if you're looking down at the bullet, with the, with the, with the uh, not the pin down here, the top of it, if you look at, it's folded in like a like, almost like a yeah, it's like, like a, a yeah, like a dumpling. Like a pinch. It's like a, exactly, it's like a folded up thing, and the char and all that does is go boom. So and if there's I no projectile there. If I showed you a couple rounds, would you be able to tell me if they're the ones that look like they were on set? Uh, probably, if uh, I, I think I could probably tell you which were the rounds that were put in cosmetic okay. and the, which were the rounds that were the flash rounds. All right. Now, forgive me because I'm very upset right now. I know. But I you know, know what I'm saying, saying so please take, don't forgive my, my, my weirdness about this. This is That's all the reason not shoulder. to be doing an inter yes. interrogation right now. Yes. And the reason why I was showing it because you said you have experience, but you're saying when this does come out, it's supposed to just puff and well, not well, really be well, usually, a hard object. If there's any chance if there's any chance that when you look at the gun, so here's the barrel, here's the sight, and the cylinder's around and it has the holes. Mm -hmm. We're just looking at the gun, the camera's eye view. Yeah. When you look at the, the cosmetic rounds go in, they have no flash. But if you want to have cosmetic rounds that flash, if you want me to hold the gun, you see the bolts, and I shoot, that material is often a clay or you know, fabricated material that just disintegrates, mm -hmm. just turns to powder. And, and the and round that you put that you don't see, you're not seeing down the barrel, you're shooting, those are the flash rounds, which have the top that looks like it's like, like folded kind of things like this, where it's all kind of, it looks like someone's packed it and closed it. But specifically today was supposed to be either empty or the ones that don't even make anything. And cold so, rounds. So cold rounds, the one with the hole in it. Yes. And it's not going to, it's not supposed to puff up or powder off, like you said, well, nothing. Halls told me that when he checked the rounds with her, they were all, had the holes in them. Halls and, and told some, this. And, and sometimes he told me, when I wasn't familiar with this. Did you hear this? Uh, he talks to somebody else who talks to the armorer who checked the rounds. So, yeah. And, uh, Seth, I'm not sure if you're still here, but, uh, yeah, that's just baffling. And if you are here, we can't hear you. Just all right. Yeah, I don't get why they've got like this triple. <sighs> don't take a gun from somebody who's like, yeah, I asked this other person to check. Is this any better? Yes. There we go. Yeah. Is that not Is any better? Uh, you're a little quiet, but we can still hear you there. Okay, yeah, it looks like my mic dropped out for some reason. It Sometimes that happens. It's like, is this not weird that he's like, I talked to the, you know, the assistant director who talked to the armor and he said she checked? Yeah, that would never happen. That would never happen. We don't ever communicate through anyone else, right? Our communication yeah. is directly with our talent at all times. So I would never pass information to my talent through an assistant director. Um, when I read the first reports... Uh, that came out on the day when, when the investigation first launched. The initial report said that the armor was not present and that the firearm had been left sitting on a camera cart just outside the door to the set. And that when they called for the armor on the radio, they got no response. They called for her two or three times, no response. The assistant director stepped off the set looking for the armor couldn't find her, but did see the firearm sitting on the camera cart unattended just outside the door. He then picked up the firearm, walked it onto the set without checking it, put it into Mr. Baldwin's hand and called the firearm cold. That was the initial report. Jeez. Yeah. 
like, I mean, yeah. first of all, I mean, I think if you find a gun sitting there and the armor is not around it, it's like, we need to have words with the armor right now. 100%. 100%. Like, the, the, the number of problems in that are, I mean, every aspect of that scenario is a problem. From the armor not babysitting the firearm to the firearm being left alone on a, on a camera cart to an assistant director thinking that he had the understanding, education, and wherewithal to pick up that firearm, put it into an actor's hand, and then to make matters worse, call the status of the firearm without even checking it. So, yeah, it's it's bizarre. Um, it's funny because I'm actually planning a video where I've got some film dummies, you know, like would actually be used on a set. And I can probably get a friend of mine who's never shot a firearm before to uh, to tell me which ones should go in the gun and which ones shouldn't mm -hmm. blindfolded. Yeah. You know, like this is the level of, uh, you know, there are plans for how to make this as safe as possible and they are taking none of those steps and instead doing crazy things no and what, what i'm finding most interesting about this entire interview though is his choice of terminology and i have to wonder whether or not his choice of terminology is intentional or whether it's unintentional because he's saying things he's using non-industry standard terminology here he's talking about flash guns flash powder flash this he's talking about prop guns then he starts making reference to um, you know, to, to policy and, and handling procedures. And, and he's not using our terminology. We speak a language in film. Yeah. And, and he's not speaking our language. He's choosing to not use the proper words for what it is that we do and how we do it. And I don't understand why. I'm trying to follow what his mindset would be, why it is that he's choosing to in, intentionally not use the words. Uh, I don't know whether there's something behind that or whether it's just I'm know. wondering if he's talking down to the officers or if he's just trying to make it seem like if he's trying to sort of cushion it. It's possible. I mean, he's talking about cosmetic bullets. Yeah. Right. We don't, we don't, that's not a term used in our industry. We don't, there's no such thing as a cosmetic bullet. We have dummy rounds, we have blanks and that's it. We never have live fire ammunition. So we have dummy rounds and we have blanks. That's it. Well, so. and he's talking about like these clay projectiles. Yeah, no um, idea what that is. I have no idea what he's talking about. Yeah, not a single armor I talked to is like has, has ever no. described a clay projectile. No, they no. just no. We don't so. use clay. We don't use clay dummy bullets. We don't. That's that's not what we do. We try and keep this as close to real as possible because we have an audience who's discerning. They are looking to pick out the problems that we make. You know, the mistakes that we make and the flaws in our film. And so oh, yeah. we, try, we try and limit those flaws as much as possible. So we'll take a real bullet and that's what we'll use as our dummy round. We'll take that real bullet. We'll put it in a bullet puller. We'll yank the sucker apart. We'll take out all the, you know, all the components of that bullet that are uh, dangerous or, or pyrotechnic. We'll put it back together again in an inert condition. And you as the viewer can't tell the difference. So I, I don't know what, a, I don't know what a clay bullet is. I don't, I don't know what that is. Well, and the other thing is this notion that then you pull the trigger and it turns into nothing as it fires. Yeah. I'm like, first of all, if it's only intended to be cosmetic, why would it have a, you know, why would it have powder behind it? Yeah, and, it wouldn't. Yeah, it wouldn't. And are you really going to depend on that clay uh, disintegrating every time? Is that what he's saying here? Is, is he saying that the clay round is actually a projectile that, that disintegrates? Yeah. He was mentioning that before, that the clay disintegrates into nothing and... Yeah, no, 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 absolutely not. So, so, so your audience is clear. A blank round, okay. So, so to compare the difference between a bullet and a blank round, they are effectively the exact same thing, except that a blank is missing one component, and that, that's the copper projectile or the lead projectile. So, a blank round is made up of a of a brass casing, a small little projectile, or excuse me, a small little pyrotechnic charge in the bottom, which is uh, which basically is what ignites the gunpowder inside that brass casing. And then there's sometimes a wax tip or the, the end of the brass casing is encrypted shut so that the powder doesn't fall out. But there is nothing that actually comes out of the fire. And there's nothing that discharges or leaves the barrel. It, it, the only thing that, that will actually leave the barrel is a gas discharge, which is the gunpowder being burnt up inside the barrel and exiting the end of the barrel as a gas. Yeah. Right. So I, I don't know what this clay, I mean, God, if I ever stepped onto a film set and loaded clay bullets into a gun it would be my last day on the job yeah it's just <laughs> it's so weird but yeah. uh anyway yeah let's, let's see what else he has to say they'll take the round and if it's a cold round 
it'll have the holes on, and inside will be BBs, and you shake it. Yeah. So when you yeah, shake the BB, it's an acoustic thing to tell you that's a cold round. Okay. And yeah, that's so, and that's what. Inside what this base is stuff that rattles, little BBs that rattle. So you take it, you go, that's a cold round that goes in the gun. Okay. And that's what you were supposed to have today. I was supposed to have an empty gun. Empty. Or when we shot, for the rehearsal, empty. Mm -hmm. And then when we shot, the flash rounds that everybody preps. And then she says, hot gun. She announces it, and the crew gets ready. But that, that, didn't, that you didn't even get to that I rehearsed today. with a hot gun. Now. But you were supposed to be cold. And it was, well, it was supposed to be cold or empty. But now, not only did I rehearse with a hot gun, I rehearsed with a gun that had a bullet inside. That's a hot if gun. That's what came out of the show. This is the most horrifying thing I've ever heard in my life. Well, so, yeah, and that's why I wanted to make sure that you, any time that you shot a hot gun, um, you've never seen anything like this come out before. Never. Because I'm not familiar with prop guns. Never. I can tell you what a projectile looks like, and that does well, look like a projectile. Let me ask you this. That's a bullet. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, so that's what comes out of... Well, I think the question, bullet. I mean, I don't really want to tell you your job, mm -hmm. but I'm so sick about this, so sickened by this, that a bullet passed through this girl's body. She's in critical condition in a hospital right now, and I fired the gun. I can't tell if it's... And you know, if the guy feels really, really shitty about that, I do, but the question was. becomes, who, if you ask Hannah, did you commingle live bullets? What, what, they, what they call live rounds. A lot, when they say live rounds, that's a bullet that, that a police officer would shoot. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from yeah. in her kit? It was in the ammo yeah. can. Um, she commingled live rounds with dummy rounds or movie rounds. And we asked her, we asked her that, uh, do you know where you guys get the rounds from, who orders it, or you don't have any part of any of that? Who, me? Yeah, like, no, she, that's her, yeah. All familiar, okay. Well, what I know is when we come to the set, you hand me a, a, a cold gun, nothing's in reverse. Then we load the gun with the flash rounds and we shoot. That's it. Every time. We've never had a problem. The other thing I wonder about is if the, uh, the AD, when he picks up this gun, mm -hmm. didn't shake it and hear like a BB at least in there? Uh, apparently he didn't check it at all. He, oh, he walked the gun right to Mr. Baldwin, put it in his hand and called it a cold gun. And that was it. And, and I think, uh, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier about how you know they create this panic scenario in film. Everything's gotta go rush, 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 now, 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 now. So yeah. you can picture the scenario. You got, you, know, you got 50 people on that film set all wearing radios. And we've all got our little squiggly earpieces in. And, and all of us are listening the assistant director calling on the air for the armor and we're hearing nothing but dead air in response right no answer from the armor no answer from the armor they come on the air again this gutierrez hannah armaments come back no answer no reply people start getting frustrated they start getting annoyed and this panic starts to set in and so the assistant director will now step up and take charge of this scenario he's now going to be you know he's the man in charge he's going to step up and deal with it the armaments are you know armaments is not on set i'll deal with her later Where's the gun? I'll solve this problem, right? And he steps in and, and picks up a, a gun off of a cart that he had no business touching. That he didn't know the status of that firearm. He didn't know whether that gun was loaded, not loaded, safe, cold, hot. Uh, at the end of the day, what I was saying before about how there's only two people in film that should ever touch that firearm. The armament expert is responsible for the firearm and the talent that's deploying it in front of the camera. And that's yep. it. The AD had no business getting involved. Yeah, it's like cutting the armor out of that interaction well i mean if the armor wasn't there then they should not have proceeded period yeah. right period that's it there's there's nothing else to be discussed on the matter if the armaments expert is not on site we now have to stop and wait it means we're going to lose time it means we're going to lose money and maybe we're going to dock that from her pay maybe we're going to replace her for this maybe it's maybe it's a fireable offense whatever yeah. it may be but we're not just going to push forward yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's a difference between saying, like, listen, we're super pissed at the armor uh, and just, eh, we're going to go ahead. Like, right, right. this is not a job you can do. No, it's not this, an option. It's not an this option. is like, you know, oh, the surgeon didn't show up. So um, so we're just going to get the nurse to do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> let's uh, let's see what this goes. Oh. You didn't even get part to that second part of you'll hand it back. I do want to ask you about Dave Holt. Um, 
I understand sometimes she'll hand the gun off to Dave Halls and then he'll hand it to you. Did that happen okay. at this incident? It I never recall ever doing it. It was Hannah handing I never recall. I recall that when we would stop the scene, if we finished the scene, Halls is someone who is assumed by his position to be authorized to do nearly everything. Mm -hmm. So if I was doing a scene with you and we finished the scene, and we finished your angle and we were going to turn around and shoot my angle, we, we just, when they say turning around, that means it's time to go to the bathroom, go get a bottle of water, go get a coffee, go smoke a cigarette. We have a break. And if I was going to go to the bathroom, I'd hand Halls the gun nope. to give to her. I would only nope. hand it to her. Or if she wasn't around, if she was, if she was away, because she'd be in the shop. They clearly and holds the guys. They give it to her. No. Give this to to, oh. to uh, Hannah. Sometimes, so sometimes you would hand the gun to Hall, but you never. Um, she, he never handed the gun to you. No. Okay. No. No. So you would hand it to him. I would pass it off to him if she was not on site, and I was going to want to use the bathroom. I'm going to buy. That's very typical. Halls is empowered and authorized to to hand him the weapon. He's the only no, other person. No, he is not. So did, say, the producer decide this? Yeah, this is an internal decision. This is something that they decided within their production. I can tell you on every film set I have ever been involved with, I have never once had an assistant director even attempt to pick up a firearm off of the table. They know that that is not their jurisdiction, and they do not cross that boundary. Yeah, I mean, that's, oh, oh this is just one of those things, like, you know, I, I did research for looking at this, and I'm just hearing what he's doing. I'm just like, this is against the protocols that 100 percent yeah and you know it's funny because i was talking to a bunch of armors i didn't end up you know talking to you when i was doing all of that but you know i talked and it was kind of getting repetitive like people were saying <laughs> we all like, say the same thing yeah, yeah exactly people yeah. all are have the same protocols because yeah. that's just how you make a film safe it's we listen we've been doing this for for 40 50 60 years i mean you know this isn't something that we just figured out yesterday uh, these policies and procedures have been in place for a long time, and as firearms have progressed and as firearms have modified, our, our you know our policies and procedures have modified with them. But uh, but this is not something new. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, On oh. we go. <laughs> yeah, he's making me mad. We were done. Yeah. We were done. Whether it was a cold gun with no things or flash rounds, I'd say hot gun and the two. Well, usually not. Because usually it was it was a, it was a hot gun. If it was a hot gun, we were going to shoot Chibi right nearby. Okay. If I hit, because other times we have rubber guns. You know, think, uh, yeah, think. Yeah. yeah. And uh, specifically, sorry, right before this incident, Hannah handed you the gun and said, "Cold." It wasn't Dave. I don't be cold. No, Hannah handed me the gun. Okay. It wasn't. Yeah, that's else that's no, interesting. That me is me it directly in opposition to the initial report that she, I, I believe she said cold. I don't be cold. Yeah. Where? So this is my. I'm not that great of a drawer, but this is the church. This is the front where the. the yeah, you enter here. Yeah. Church, uh, cross the cross is. Where did she hand it? The gun to you inside? Why was it? Oh, yes, I was In other words, I was. This is a scene in the church where you come in and there's a lot of disarray. There's benches tipped over and they're like, and here was one bench that was upright and sturdy. Some of the other benches are prop benches so they can smash easily with, with uh, explosives. You want the gunfire to have uh, um, fake benches that are made of a lighter wood so that they put charges inside. So when you shoot, Cinematically, when a guy is shooting a gun, you turn around and see what he's shooting at. You're going to see charges that are buried inside. They put a little material around. You're going to see boom, boom, boom. It seems flash. That is a prop bench. There were prop benches around that they would eventually going to put today. We're going to put squibs in to have them blow up. And this was a real bench, a heavy. Because if you sat on the prop bench, it would break. Mm -hmm. This was a live bench, and I sat here. And the camera was here, and she was here, and Joel was here. She being Helena? Helena. Okay. And I'm here on the bench, sitting. I'm right here to the right. I'm all, all, all the way to one side. They wanted me to go all the way to that side. And the camera guy was here. He's behind. Hannah was here. Joel was here. Where the other people, I believe that the, problem, the, the script woman is always in that corner, so she can see the action. And when I shot the gun, away from the cameraman. I would never aim against the camera. I turned and I went like this to stay in the camera and she was there and the gun went off and she just went right on the ground. What about the 
armorer, though, or was she? She's outside. Okay. She has she been a gun. In. She has been a gun all the time. And then what? If there's any her? shooting involved in the scene, she always hands me the gun. Mm -hmm. Never has Dave handed you the gun. Never. Okay. And then she goes back outside. She waits outside because she just can't be there. So they don't want to see. Sometimes in the scene, there's reflections, like you know, you you see. No, so no, she, no, no, so no, no, you no. only need the necessary crew in there for shooting the camera. No, 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 and we're supposed to be with what's called within arm's reach. Uh, but realistically, for camera, that's not always possible. So we're just outside arm's reach. But we are always there. To yeah. say that, to say that uh, Hannah was, you know, not there because, you know, uh, she couldn't be there because, you know, there's reflections or we couldn't have that many people in the room. Absolutely not. She's considered uh, essential crew at that point, And she would 100% be there. What's really interesting is that there's direct opposition to the initial sheriff's report that came out. So the initial sheriff's report that came out on the day stated that, that the armor was not present, the firearm was left on a camera cart, and that the, camera, the firearm was retrieved by the assistant director and handed to Mr. Baldwin. He's now saying in this interview that she directly handed him the gun. So we've got, we got you know, two different stories here. Yeah, and you'd think that they would have some, uh, some issues with that. And, yeah, I, I've heard, you know, things about, like, we have to frame our camera angles so that the the guy with the gun can be standing as close to as possible to the armor yeah. without the armor actually being visible. That's right. We have to be, we're supposed to be with what's called within arm's reach, but I mean, that's not realistic. Arm's reach means I got to be, you know, three, four feet away from you. Yeah. And, and the camera is going to see more than three or four feet on either side of you. So that's not always realistic. So we, we do take a little Liberty in that we take a few steps back just outside of camera's range so that we're, we're still, we're there, but we're not on top of you. We're, we're close enough that that uh, that should something go wrong, we can call a cut. We can step in. We can intervene very quickly. But yeah. but we're not you know we're not within within sight of the camera. So yeah, and the ability to at least lunge forward and absolutely like, nope. yep absolutely yeah or at least call the cut, uh, step in, uh, you know grab the firearm from the actor or or like you said with the Will Smith video where where he you know reached out and, and pawned the gun and, and, and pointed it down towards the ground, that type yep. of a thing. Uh, where we'll step in and we'll or or we'll call freeze, you know. And I'll, a lot of times I'll I'll prep my actors in advance and I'll say to them, "Listen, if you hear me call freeze, stop. Do not move. It means that you are in jeopardy. I'm calling that freeze for you. Yeah, right. That that freeze belongs to you. Nobody else on the crew. No other talent. That's all yours. And if you hear me say that word, do not move, because it means that something has gone wrong. In other yeah. words, the firearm is about to malfunction, or you're about to step on a pyrotechnic charge, or you're about to fall off the back of the stage and you don't know it. But I'm that direction is specifically for you. So, um, so no, no, no. Yeah, don't turn. Don't look around. Don't do don't anything. anything. Don't move. Just, yeah, freeze. Yeah. So, so no. We for him to say, oh, well, she was outside of the room. She was around the corner. She was non-essential crew. That's 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 garbage. Yeah, I mean, she's the armor, and yeah. they're playing with guns. Of yeah. course, yeah. she's yeah. essential. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's uh, keep going here. Moving on. Cut. Okay. Okay. Real quick before she shows you that, the other thing I wanted to know, and it's probably helpful when she does show you those drums. Um, have you, in your experience, ever been told that you're not supposed to cock the gun? No. No, you're you're okay. He wanted, he wanted me to cock the gun okay. at the scene. Okay. He wanted that as part of the scene. So if I could take the gun out, turn, and cock it into the to the to the right, my left to their right of the lens. But we, in other words, if I'm sitting here and you're the camera, we don't talk about my left. We talk about camera right. Camera right. We only talk about the camera. Camera right is my left. Okay. So if I'll say to you, where do you want me to aim the gun? They'll say camera right. So I'll aim the gun to my left. Okay. So I always aim the gun away. But she was there. And in the rehearsal, he wanted me to pull out the gun and cock the gun. And if you're assuming you have a cold gun, there's no problem. Right. And again, a cold gun I've had, every time we've used guns in this film, the last two weeks, we never had one problem. Never. Never. I, I hate how often he's said, like, we went two weeks without murdering anybody. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. we went two weeks yeah. without accidentally shooting anybody. I'm like, yeah, but wasn't there reports of three negligent discharges within the past couple of weeks prior to the incident? 
Yeah. They weren't a camera for that long. People need to understand when we make a movie, that movie takes us four to five, sometimes six weeks. That's it. From the time that we start production till the time we roll our trailers off of that compound is four to six weeks on in general, 30 to 45 days. So, you know, it's not like this was a six month endeavor that they were at and they managed to make it, you know, two weeks without an accident. You know, no, you guys were only a camera for a couple of weeks before you got shut down. So for him to say, well, we made it two weeks with no accidents. I'm not sure that's accurate. Well, uh, and this is an industry that is sitting there marking the, it has been, you know, X many days since yeah, an accident. Right. Yeah. In decades yeah. up until this, yeah. you know, and he's talking about, oh, well, things were good for two weeks. It's like, shh. Yeah. And now, oh. and, and, and let's, it's interesting to see what he says next, because is he making reference to the discharges? I don't think he's going to, he hasn't said it so far. And I, I have a real strong feeling it's not going to come up. No, I think but, so too. Uh, let's see. Let's find out. And I don't, maybe you guys discuss this when I'm going. Um, after the gun was shot, who did you hand the gun to? I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember. I made everybody freaked out. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Which one of those two people holds? Okay. I don't really know. I would imagine. Well, there's the dummy there. So that's probably a dummy round. And there's no drill in this. That might be uh, a flash round. And as I said, so very, flash rounds do not have holes? Well, you, the flash round has a charge in here, okay. of powder, different sizes. Like I said, quarter half full load, and a wadding in there to pack it in. It's packed in tightly. Okay. So when you hit this pin, it explodes. Now, sometimes it has this material there if you have to have the cosmetic feature through the gun and then shoot. But often it has, there's the BBs in there. This is a, this is a dummy round. No dummy here, but there's that. My point is that very often when you give me, when she's loaded the gun with rounds for us to go hot and flash and shoot, they've had that creased, folded head. Mm -hmm. The dumpling head, as we say. Okay. They've almost never. How can he not tell the difference here? Uh, I have no comment. <laughs> like, yeah. this is literally really important for him to, to be yeah. able to do. Because yeah. uh, when you've got the armor showing him, hey, look, I'm loading the gun and I'm loading it with what I'm telling you I'm loading it. And you're supposed to be checking because you're responsible too. Mm -hmm. Um that's what I was saying before. When we do everything with transparency, we do it in front of the talent. We do it in front of the crew. I count out the rounds as, I, as I'm loading them into the firearm, and, and the actor is counting them out with me because we want to make sure that we're both on the same page. We know exactly how many times that gun is going to go bang. I mean, yeah. you know, anyway. Well, the old line, uh, you know, about gun ranges is that there's uh, the two loudest sounds on a gun range is uh, a click when you expected a bang and a bang when you expected Expect a, click. a click. Yeah, that's very well so, said. That's well said. Yeah, no, that one stuck with me, and I was like, right, I, yep, that's that's, that's, that's accurate. True. Yeah, that's that's 100% accurate. It's true. And I see people wondering about the BBs in terms of, like, the BB isn't a projectile there. It's just a little metal ball that's placed in the casing itself where the powder otherwise would be, so that when you rattle it, like a normal... Uh, cartridge doesn't rattle and so this the bb just makes it rattle so that you can have that you know that cue uh that it's actually just a, a you know a dummy as opposed to a real cartridge so that's why they put a bb in there uh, look like this for the flash only when the camera sees inside the cylinder do you put those in there but those are both dummy rounds that's a dummy Here. round that's a dummy round that's what they taught me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I, I'm not an expert. I am not know. I'm sure you have more experience with some of the other than we do. Don't find out, though. I'm sure my, 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 I always see it in my wife. I think I should get a gun. I'm getting a little nervous about the world I'm up. I was like, no, 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 no. I'm with my other. I have six kids. I'm 63 years old, and I have an eight year old, a six year old a five-year-old, a three-year-old, a one-year-old, and an eight-month-old that we had as a surrogate. Oh, and a gosh. staff of bodyguards. I was three years old, and we had, <laughs> seven, we had six kids in seven years. So my wife was always, she was born in the U.S. but raised in Spain. She's like, I like we will not be having any guns in the house. 
No, no, no. <laughs> but <coughs> okay. I believe there's a two, uh, uh, kind of dummy round. So you called this a flash round, right? No. Flash round means there's, there's a charge in there. No charge in there, if you hear that sound. Okay. No charge in there if you see that. So what happens so when you shoot told. these? Or to what you? You put them in there cosmetically with nothing in them so that through the cylinder you can see that. Okay. You can see in the cylinder whether the cylinder is empty or they look bad, continuity-wise, or that there's a round in there. So they put a cosmetic round in the chamber. They load the gun, close it, and then I hold the gun. You see the things in there. A flash round would be like a what well, crimped is the word, a yeah. crimped round with a charge inside. And that one shoots, and there's no projectile. I'm really challenged whether they ever see I doubt sometimes they have these where you can do both, but that's the clay uh, uh, material. But usually, 99% of the time when we shot a flash round, it was the crimp thing, and you don't see inside the cylinder. Okay. So you're in the camera, and I'm not pointing where you can see it. I'm off a little bit, and all you see is the flash. Do you know what would happen if you shot one of these? Have you ever had experience with that? Nothing. Nothing happens with them? There's no charge in them. This is this this Did indicates. The right. Well, sometimes they have the pin to create something. I'm, I'm just saying. When I look at this, when I go like this. Now, by the way, there could be a charge in there, and that charge and those BBs could come out. I don't oh. know. I, I don't know enough about it to know whether this rattling indicates that it's an empty, uh, a cold round. That's obviously a cold round because that's where the gunpowder would be in here. Mm -hmm. That's a cold round. This, I'm assuming, is a cold round, because they go like this to tell themselves it's a cold round. I believe, please don't take my word for it. I'm Just in your experience. I'm a father of six children, pretty much. That's all I do these days. My experience is those are both cold rounds. Okay. And I was told by Halls that when they took the gun away and looked at them, every round inside the gun was a cold round, except the one round it was not only a hot round, it was a live round with a bullet. If you're telling me... And this is one of these things that so many people uh, who come before the law have an allergy to one important thing, which is saying, I don't know. Like, it's, it's perfectly fine for somebody to be handed two cartridges and just be like, I'm not the armor. Yeah. Yep. This is an armor's position. This is an armor's responsibility. Because... You know, he's sitting there going, well, I, I don't check this stuff. And now he's trying to pretend that he's authoritative. And, you know, when he's saying, oh, well, if you pulled the trigger, maybe the BB comes out. It's like, no, that is not how that works, dude. No, no, no. Uh, so, yeah, I. He should not be talking to them. And especially uh, you, you know, for the audience, it's really I can't sort of overstate how dangerous it is to talk to the police authoritatively about things that you don't know or don't understand. Because when you start making stuff up, you start creating all of this room to be attacked on credibility at a trial. Uh, all of this stuff is stuff that, you know, if I was, you know, if I was the prosecutor and Baldwin was charged, I'd be going up and saying, well, you had no problem spouting all of this bullshit in this police interview to two detectives, didn't you? How do we know you're not spouting bullshit now in court? And, you know, that's incredibly damaging. So, uh, yeah, keep yeah. your mouth shut if you don't know what you're talking about. Why, why do you think it is that he's doing this? I mean, if you had to weigh in with an expert opinion as to why it is that he is talking like this, what, what do you make of this? Well, this is certainly not the advice of his lawyer. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure it's not the advice of his publicist because his publicist would probably be like, shut the hell up and let us, you know, I think he's just kind of arrogant enough to figure he's going to go in there and sort this out. Why is there no counsel present? Uh, because he is not being smart. He could have had counsel present. They start the interview, like the interrogation off saying you've got a right to counsel present. Uh, he just wasn't smart enough to be like, yes, that is a thing I should do right now. Yeah. Uh, so <sighs> you should totally have a lawyer present. You know, if they say, hey, do you want a lawyer? Um, you want a lawyer. <laughs>
So I think he just thinks he's going to talk his way out of it. And uh, strangely enough, because he's Baldwin, uh, it seems to work for him. But if this if this guy wasn't Baldwin, if this was you know Joe Schmo, uh, I think he would probably be ending this interrogation with, "Okay, sir, um, we are charging you with some offenses. Um, you know, please turn around. We're gonna you know, you know, yeah, please come yeah. this way. We're gonna you know." Take yep. your cell phone. We're going to, you know, do all this. We're going to take so. him for processing. Yeah. No, it's funny because I had a conversation with some industry people uh, a little after the, a while after this happened. And one of them said, you know, he's going to skate. And yep. we said, you know, why do you say that? And they said, because are you going to be the guy that testifies against Alec Baldwin? And that was a very strong comment. You know, I, I mean, if you are you going to be the guy in our industry? Are you going to be the technician in our in our industry? And we're low men on the totem pole in this business. Yeah, you know, are we going to be the guy that stands up against someone like Alec Baldwin and absolutely commits career suicide in the process? Yeah, so. it's that's kind of the unfortunate thing is when you've got enough power, uh, the world just kind of shapes itself to forgive you for all sorts of things, and. I am pretty sure that if I was in that room giving this story, uh, I would be getting like this interview would have end, would end with charges. I think he's given enough. If this was in Canada, I think he's given enough to lay a careless use charge. Um, so, but again, he's not in Canada, so I don't know necessarily, you know, what the standards are, but um, in Canada, I think this would be enough to lay charges on the, against a few people. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. But that's what came out of his shoulder. There's something really, really scary going on here. Well, and I think that's what something she was trying really to ask is if, if any time, well, you said these are cold ones, but the ones that are not cold, the quarter, right. those, they have the crimp head. They have, yeah. have you ever seen anything like that ever come out on set? No, it's not possible. Not possible. Okay. Yeah, they don't have a head. So they, they, they don't have a. There's no projector. There's no projector. Okay. So then, does the tactic just say they don't have a head? Somebody no. put a live bullet in the gun. Okay. Because they shouldn't separate or do that either. No. Okay. Separate. I'm not at all probably. Like that shouldn't come out either. When if it, it does. If you did a flash round, that wouldn't be there. Okay. This is a cosmetic round only. Right. I point the gun. That's in the cylinder. When we shoot the gun, 99% of the time, it's a flash round that you don't see the cylinder. Mm -hmm. You're the camera, and I'm slightly off, so you don't see the gun. <laughs> I'm sorry, we keep having you explain that, but it's just because there's different rounds. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this is a cosmetic round, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if there is, another question to you is, is there a cosmetic round? That, I mean, is there a flash round that has the head, which I believe they have, where you can shoot into the gun, meaning, if the director wants you to aim the gun at the camera, they put a loose sight screen up there, and I shoot the gun at you, you can see the bullets inside there, or they can go to do that with a computer. Mm -hmm. But if I put the thing toward you and then shoot, they'll have a round that has this on there that'll explode. But again, I've been told that is a clay material or something that just dissolves on explosion. No, no projectile comes out. On a flash round, on a flash round, it blows up, that you shoot on camera. Quarter, half, full. There is no projectile unless some material is stuck in the barrel of the gun. Okay. And I thought for sure what happened was, did they not check there was a, a, a stone or whatever? Now again, I am speechless. We're here shooting, everything was going fine. I am speechless as he's been talking for 55 minutes. Dude, speechless is what you ought to be. Mm. Uh. Joel is my friend. I'm one of the producers on this movie. Mm -hmm. We've developed this movie together for three years. I left my wife and six kids in New York to come here for a month to shoot this movie. And I'm the one that shot the gun today that had a live bullet go through that woman's body and into his body. And I need to know, how did that happen? Where did that bullet come from? Where did a lot? There's, there are no live rounds in her. Can I'm told? Yeah, Everybody yeah. is sitting around waiting for me to come here with all the sheriffs and all the people, the people that were there, waiting for us to get ready to come and uh, do this with you. 
And they, all they did was talk about that. But it's speculation. Of like, in her kit, she doesn't have live rounds. And, and that's what we were told. That's what we asked her. She said, it's, there is no live rounds, not even in her kit, not on set, anywhere. So For that very reason. we want to know the same question too. Yeah, how if there's not supposed to be any light rounds on set, then it comes down how to and who yeah. will manufacture Should have had counsel. For them. Uh, that a cosmetic round shot the this projectile through them? Yeah. Is that possible? Did you find out? I don't know. It's possible. Oh it is. They told you the mechanically if that's possible. Yes. I've so sometimes there is a charge in the end of not intentionally, but then it's not a dummy say. round. Then it's a live round. <laughs> uh. Today I sit here, and whether it was a misfiring theatrical round or a live one, I shot this woman with a gun today. I just feel so good, you know. Come on, I, I can imagine that would not feel good. I feel really bad, you know. It's like I don't. I mean, everything was going great. The only problem we had was when these six guys wanted to quit. And there, I don't know the, the jargon, but there, uh, uh, you know, a union rep or whatever in the New Mexico contract, different contracts in different states, the person that was in charge of these people had a kind of a pipeline, a lot of shooting going on, a lot of movie, TV work in uh, Albuquerque, Santa Fe. The person was their head person, I was told, told them, don't strike. It's not again. We want. We don't want to cripple the indie business and put all of our employees out of work. Our indie contract is 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 set for now. You have a contract you're under. Now we can renegotiate that contract, which no doubt they will. Uh, but in the meantime, you have a contract. Did they you walk off them, over these kinds those of things? Those men came. I'm not criticizing them. Yeah, they came I'm, under a contract which they knew that. what it was. So they reported to work, like and then halfway the through the disingenuous the, uh, the, uh, on shooting, here. they left. They they walked off. Thank you for joining us, Dave. You know, when he said to me, well, my guy's just sleeping in my car, the ADs and the producers said to me, well, they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're all of a sudden complaining about a contract. They've been working on it for quite a while. And, uh, and some days we wrap, and they have, they shoot nights. Those are tough. The men, the women, they have to go back to their homes and maybe Albuquerque and drive an hour. And it's 3 o'clock in the morning, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we try to put the night shooting on the weekends so when you wake up, follow me to your off. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, um, and then some days we wrapped the ferry. The, the day before they walked up the job we wrapped at five forty five in the afternoon. It a very reasonable day. <laughs> it a very easy day, say so six o'clock. Mm -hmm. I'm driving away with them and I waved to that guy. The guy said, I want to talk to you, the heavy set guy. Yeah. And I'm leaving I said, I'll see you tomorrow and I left. Because I want to get go and get home. Right. I want to go call my kids before they go to bed in New York. And uh, the um, uh, Yesterday, when I was driving, when I saw him, the sun was still out. We didn't shoot a day like we usually shoot till we lose the light. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here to shoot New Mexico. Yeah. New Mexico is the star the of the movie. Yeah. Okay. So, do you, in your opinion, feel that this could have been an accident, or do you? I want to believe that. Do, 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 well, let me ask you this. Cause I don't know anything about this because it was it was such mayhem when this happened. Mm -hmm. Everybody was sick that this happened because we didn't know. No, no one imagined. Everyone thought she was hit by wadding or she got burned. No one presumed she was shot with a bullet. Any projectile went through her body. That's no, no one even considered that that wasn't possible. So the question is, the cartridge that came out. The cartridge is when the gun that they fired. Have you got that? No. So we have to send that. We don't analyze that stuff. We collect it, but then we send it to lab. But it was analyze. collected. You have it will be. Right. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Is that to me, I'm like, I'm wondering, what was that? What was in that? The measure, I don't know anything about that. What are they, what ballistics? How can they measure what was in that? Mm -hmm. How much of it? And that's, that'll all be done at the lab. Yeah. I, I don't know. All I knew was the gun went off, she hit the floor, he hit the floor, he started screaming. He was in a lot of pain. She went into shock. She went into shock. She didn't talk. Right. Her eyes are rolling back in her head. And uh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, bad. And everybody's just getting really, blah, and then they blah, start doing blah. CPR, and, putting, and everybody gets really panicky. And then people start wondering, you know, what did something, we assumed, because the wadding can burn you, there's material that can come out under that, very rarely, that could burn you. But remember, that often doesn't happen because there's no way to call a gun on the rehearsal. 
And the times you only get the warning comes out and it hits somebody, like they're 20 feet away from you in a gunfight, the crew is away. You're not shooting anybody near the crew. And my point is that when this and when she went down, I thought, what was stuck? We all said the same thing. What was stuck in the barrel? Was something left? They didn't clean the barrel, which we, they always do, always. And was there a rock or something that went, that went through her body? I didn't know about the passing through her body. I know she was hit. I didn't know where, and I don't know what to what extent. But we all presumed as we're sitting outside, bullshitting for the last two hours while this went on, the aftermath, we assumed something was launched in the barrel, was a projectile that went into her body. Now, when you tell me that's what came out of Joel's shoulder, that's a faulty round, which I've never heard of that before. Okay. Never. No, that's I've a life part of a, a faulty of a theatrical round. flash round that was loaded into a gun that had a projectile that misfired, and that projectile came out that was what well, was a lethal thing. round. Normally, what you're going to have a round that has this on it. It's the material that disintegrates when you fire the gun. Because mm. no. if you take a flash round with gunpowder in it, whether it's a quarter, half, or full no. load, and you put a real bullet on, that's called a bullet. That's true. It's not a movie yeah, bullet. That's, not a cartridge. that's a bullet. Yeah. How did that happen? I mean, I'm dying. To, I'm the person that fired the gun. I'm dying to find out how that happened. Interesting choice. How did that bullet yeah. cause it? No, you're not dying, buddy. Kit? And and again. We're not going to know if it was manufacturer issues or someone did bring a live round until it's been tested and we look at the whole uh, casing and projectile of it. So is there anybody on set that you would think want, want to uh, cause a disturbance in the filming or have any issues with anybody? on set, minus what happened, if you don't think... No, in the movie happened. business, there are always some whiny people. Okay. But not so much so that they want to shoot somebody. So nothing I've never heard of anything like this in my lifetime, ever. Okay. I've made 75 movies. So in the past couple of weeks that you've been on set, there's nobody really... Mm, there's no one I would imagine would be capable of doing something like this. Mm, I mean, it would just be... Out of the ordinary. But again, I think it's a critical point to me, which is, if this is a flash round, if there's a flash round and you have a piece here, this piece has to be a certain type of which if you want, as I've told you before, if you want the shot to go off and see that the cylinder cosmetically has a, has a round in there, this is not a, a, the thing that was in Joel's shoulder. But, I, and then I want to come back to this. You said that when the gun went off, you experienced no kick. Yeah, there was no recoil. There was no recoil that I, that I remember. I mean, literally, I'm holding the gun, and, and, and let me slowly, slowly pull, turn, cop, bang, and as soon as I copy, bang! And I jump, because, I mean, you obviously, that's the last thing you think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Everything has been done. Every breath we take is to, uh, is, to, is to obviate that possibility. And the gun went off, and uh, all I can think of, as I, as I keep saying, is that I've never heard of a flash round that had a bullet on top, that had a projectile w similar to what came out of Joel's shoulder. I've never heard of that in my life, ever. Never, 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 never. Flash rounds, never, flash rounds normally have the crimping. Mm -hmm. There's a head on there. It's made of a special material. And in this scene, you were to look down the barrel of the gun and shoot. Um, you have to ask them that, by the way. You have to ask, uh, well, both of us are in the hospital now. But was it their intention? Because when I would give it the gun, I'm assuming it's a cold gun with nothing in it. When it goes to the time to shoot, are they going to see in the barrel that there's a gun there? Very often what they'll do is they'll have you put the cosmetic round and I'll draw the gun and I'll aim it, they cut. And cinematically they'll cut to the other guy going like this, then they'll cut back to me with the flash round with no projectile. At all. Yeah. But what I'm saying to you is a theatrical round, a flash round with a bullet head, I've never heard of that in my life. No, it doesn't exist. Never, never, yeah. Because that's a bullet. Yeah. Less of a charge, but that's a bullet. You can't put any projectile, anything, in front of a blanket. It becomes a projectile. It doesn't matter what I've it is. Yeah. That's, that's how, you, how you kill people. April 3rd, 1958. Do we have, um, is there someone that we can contact if we have other questions for you? My name is Jonah. Jonah J. J O N A H. So guys, you see how he throws something out there? Uh, again, keep in mind, 
if you are suspected of something serious, they will have probably, you know, there might be a trash can in the room or they might say, oh, we'll take, we'll get rid of that for you. Uh, if there's a trash can in the room, it's probably had a fresh bag in it. It is probably 100% clean uh, just so that they can make sure that if you throw anything out there, they can potentially use it as evidence. And I have seen multiple interrogations where somebody uh, like throws a Kleenex out and immediately the detective is just like, I'll be right back and picks up the trash can and takes it out of the room to change it out. Uh, because it's just like, yes, we were waiting for that. We wanted that. So thank you. So uh, I'm like, normally there's a, a lengthy period where they get the guy talking and then they start asking him more pointed questions. They're not doing that here. He's being cut a real break in this interrogation as because I would have been starting to say, so, you know, the gun went off. Um, so your finger was on the trigger, right? You know, that's like what I, you know, what I take from this, and this is weighing in with a completely amateur opinion, but from what I can take from this, these police officers have already given him a pass. They yep. kept diverting the conversation back to, do you think it's possible that somebody could have wanted to do this? Do you think it's possible somebody could have sabotaged this? Do you think it's, they just kept giving him pass after pass after pass repeatedly. Yeah, I I don't know if they decided just that, you know, oh, we can't possibly go after Baldwin, you know, unless he just drops a confession on us there or something. And he's come kind of close or, or what the deal was. But this has been a real, uh, real kid gloves interrogation. Yeah. Uh, like they should really be giving him some gears here. So uh, I, I just don't get it. So, uh well, we'll see what else they're doing here. His last name is Foxman. They told me that you wanted this, correct? Uh, J O N J O N A H Foxman. F -O -X -M -A -N. Oh, and they've. This is them blanking it out so that we don't get his details uh, when they release this. Okay. We have one more here. Yeah, there's some of that. Uh, what do you want me to do? Uh, you can go wherever. Well, let me ask you this. Originally, but this is a very complicated. I mean, modest compared to what happened to them, but my wife and my whole family were scared. Mm -hmm. And on Saturday, my daughter was going to be in the movie. They had a little part for my daughter. The eight year old? The eight year old. Oh, she was so excited to go. And now the question is Joel's not going to go back to work for a while. Right. So, can you <laughs> imagine you've had several unintentional discharges on this set? And you're like, yeah. I'm going to bring my kid to this? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what's really funny? I just picked this up in this last little portion. The number of times they've asked him a direct question, and he directly answers their direct question with the words, that, that, "That's a good question. Let me ask you this." Yeah, and he redirects. And normally they will shut that down hard. In... Uh, he's he's done a time after time after time throughout this entire interview. Yeah, normally they'll be like, "We're asking the questions. You know, you need to answer these questions. They're not so." So would you say then in your professional opinion that this is a just a joke of an interview? It's a really weird interview. They're I mean, this guy has to be on their list of suspects, right? You know, in terms He's of the one that pulled the trigger. Yeah. So you've got to be considering him for the possibility of, you know, at at least, you know, some sort of negligence issue. Um yes. you know, some sort of, you know. And they're really just trying to find, like, they're just basically asking him questions about the movie industry. They're asking him, like, oh, could anybody have, you know, intended, you know, intended harm? Like, which is such a weird question here, right? Because it's, unless you've I, got some actual, you know, I mean, I guess ask it. But, like, unless you've got some actual business for that, it's just... 
in your yeah. experience, in your experience, have you ever witnessed the police giving so many options to somebody that they're interviewing? <laughs> Often at the beginning, but the point of that is to, you know, you keep the person talking and then you start narrowing, you know, their sort of sphere of things. They're not getting to that second phase of of actually starting to go, well, you've told me this story, but what about these things? You know, and that's something I was really kind of expecting them to do is to start saying, well, uh, what about this? What about that? You know, it's your story doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And yeah, it just. Uh, yeah, it just kind of. Uh, baffles me here that they're just this is like one of the this is typically like what they're doing when they're talking to somebody who's not at all potentially a suspect you know where like if you were across the street and you saw a robbery at the convenience store across the street mm -hmm. and you stepped out and you know you're describing this to the officers this is that's the kind of interview this is right so this like, is a witness this, interview this is not yeah, an interrogation exactly so I kind of feel like he should have been on the suspect list, not the witness list at this right, point. Right. So, yeah. Well, let's, uh, there's somebody's asking how much is left. Uh, not too much, uh, just a few minutes. So we'll let's be, we'll try to get here. through that. I doubt it'll be back to work in a week or two at that. Who knows what they're going to do? They're going to get the shit suit out of them. He, I mean, I think his was a shoulder. He might, you know, I don't know. It's up to him how he feels and stuff on. I'm, but I'm, sure, I'm sure that there are so many insurance issues for them. There's going to probably a halt. They're in a lot of trouble, insurance-wise and, 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 and uh, uh, civil action-wise. What I'm saying is, is, I told them I would stay here tomorrow. My family's not going to come down. They're in a lot of trouble. Like, you're in a lot of trouble, dude. Yeah, didn't you uh, just say they're going to get the shit suit out of them? Yeah. He's um, a producer. Yeah, how does he, how is he just not, uh, he, apparently he's detached himself from all of this. Yeah, he's, you know, whatever fault is happening, it's somewhere else. So, yeah. All right, let's uh, let's keep going. I begged them to come, and my wife wants to cancel the trip. She says she thinks it's just a weird energy. I told the producers that I would stay tomorrow in case anybody else, their insurance investigators, anybody, their lawyers wanted to talk to me. And then Saturday, I was going to fly home to New York. I just wait for them to tell me what to do. Did you need me to stay here beyond Saturday? I, I will do whatever you tell me to do. Okay, so I think so. What, what we need to do, we're going to go and process the scene. If there's any else that comes up um, and that we need to contact you, you said you'll be here till Saturday. Or you as want of to now, fly? Oh no, as of now, I'm going to stay tomorrow to mm -hmm. make myself available to the insurance investigators and their return, the production's attorneys. Yeah. To make myself available. They've told me they're not sure they need to talk to me. I'm going to see you tomorrow and get on a plane Saturday to go home. And God knows when we're going to come back. It might be months. Okay. So I can contact yeah. you. Yeah. As long as we have this number, he's not going to change it. Right, the numbers, if you know, knowing what I'm trying to say is that I'm going to leave You're on okay. Saturday unless you tell me not to. You're okay. Totally. If you tell me to come back in, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. But, if I, but I, my wife wanted me to come home. Yeah. yeah. So as long as we have a way of contacting you, is no, is what we need to do to get a hold of you, okay? But I think you point unless tomorrow you hear something different from us, because right now we're going to go, we'll interview we'll something to tomorrow, I'll come here right away. Okay, yes. Tell me what you What's want. your work zone? Um, Swan, I know. Or your office, sorry. That one, I uh, don't know. I don't use it. Okay. Well, so 2850, uh, 90. Four nine zero twenty fifty. This is work cell. I'll just put. So the two of you are not best friends, and you go bowling together and go to the movies together. Yeah. Yeah. So this is my card. Uh, that's I put her name on the back of that one, but my um, office is. How do you prefer the office? Yeah. Oh, let me put my because mine's a different. What size? Yeah, I don't, um, my desk phone has issues, so I use my work cell phone all the time. And that's usually the best way to get a double make sure true. And then if I'm not at my desk either. If so I don't hear from you otherwise, I mean, I'll come in tomorrow if yeah. you prefer, but if I don't hear from you otherwise, 
as of now, I intend to go home on Saturday. So yeah, and, and that's fine because right now we still have other interviews to do. We got to go to the scene, process it. The the processing at the lab might take longer, so you might even not hear from if and then you do your backlog right now. So our investigation is remotely. If it comes to it, we will it figure it out at that point. But right as now, now my wife was come on. as of right now, you better listen to your wife <laughs> and go home. <laughs> okay. Are we ready for? Uh, I do have some very unfortunate news to tell you. What? Um, she didn't make it. <laughs> yeah. So Joel's still at the hospital. But the other person involved didn't make it. Sorry. I just didn't want you to hear it outside of here. Is there something we could do for you? Um, that was that Jonah in What? Jonah, the one back there? Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Okay, would you want Jonah in here with you? You wanna, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna yeah. make a call? You can get him. Go. Are you guys needing a ride? Or are you comfortable? I think they've got that maybe. Are you comfortable driving though? I want to go call my wife. Of course. We could even give you a ride. Okay. Can I get you more water or anything? Do you want to see the a few minutes in here? I want to go call my wife. Wow, that's the first time I've ever seen them ask somebody who just shot somebody, is there anything we could do yeah, for you? That was, um, yeah, wow. Um, like, that's, and I don't know uh, U.S. law as well as Canadian law, because uh, here, uh, if he was a suspect at all in the, you know, in the shooting death of somebody, that's a detail that they would have had to uh, present to him ahead of time, uh, early on in that interview, to say, like, listen, um, you're here because we're investigating the shooting death of, you know, and so, yeah, it's... Uh, that was that was absolutely horrifying to watch the end of that. Um, <clears throat> he uh, he was extremely cavalier, laughing with him and joking with him right up until the part where that officer said she didn't make it. Well, and I mean, what's with the cops going? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, like, laughing and joking and flirting with them, and yeah, no, I, I saw it. Um, I'm just like that is really like have a little decorum there. Um, so beyond, beyond the decorum, you know, the, the, so, so if I understand this correctly, he was just informed that he was responsible for, for her death. And yeah. then the next thing that happened was they asked him if he was okay to drive a car and if he needed a glass of water or if he needed his assistant present. Yeah. I'm pretty sure if that was anybody else, they would have been put in handcuffs and escorted to a cell. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, listen, if that happened here in Canada, let's say, God forbid, something like that happened here in Canada. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm on a film set and something goes horribly wrong like this. And, and now someone's been shot, someone dies and I'm at the police station and I'm being, I would like to say interviewed, but let's be realistic. It would be interrogated. And, uh, and I say to them, yeah, yeah, I, I pulled the trigger. Yeah. I, I definitely pulled the trigger. And now that person has been shot. 
once I've said that statement, I've now officially put myself on the hook as having admitted to effectively committing this act. Yeah. And now this person dies. And I'm pretty sure they're not going to ask me if I want a glass of water or a ride. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to a jail cell and they're going to hit me with a manslaughter charge. I have another video on defensive shootings where one of the things I talk, I say is basically nothing you tell the police will talk you out of, uh, of go of getting arrested because they will arrest at the drop of a hat when there's a dead body. Uh, it is, you know, and I see people saying murder in the chat. It's not murder because he wouldn't have had the intention to kill uh, at least, you know, unless it's some it's form of weird constructive murder in the U S but in Ca if this was in Canada, uh, you'd be looking at uh, manslaughter, I think would be on the mm. table. You know, in the sense of you carelessly use the firearm, which makes it a criminal offense. Yeah. And then it's a criminal offense that causes death, which gets you to manslaughter. Uh, but you don't have intention to kill. Uh, so at that point, you're like, that's as far as you can get is just to manslaughter on that. So there's, there's no premeditation here. This is simply an accident gone wrong that you are responsible for. And therefore, your, your charge is manslaughter. Yeah. So in Canada, uh, planned and deliberate would be for murder. And planned and deliberate is actually a little more than the U.S. standard of premeditation, because premeditation can be like you had the chance to think about it for even a moment. Okay. So like, whereas can in Canada, it's planned and deliberate, which, you know, it, it's a little bit more than that. And so, you know, if you just react in anger and that anger you know, carries you from that moment to the death, uh, that's not going to be planned and deliberate. But if you, you know, if you intentionally took some time around it, then you could get to planned and deliberate. But uh, in order to get to murder at all, like the, uh, you know, in terms of even second degree murder, you would have to have specific uh, intent to kill which means okay. you actually intended to kill this person or you were reckless uh, as to as to that. So, you know, if I shoot a, a shotgun at, you know, Bob and I don't intend for Bob to die, you could still get to murder because obviously shooting them with a shotgun is likely to kill them. Right. Um, but you are not going to get to murder if, say, you get into a fist fight with them and they happen to die. Um, at that point, you're looking at manslaughter. Um, but, you know, cr a death that is criminal in some fashion is going to get you to manslaughter. So, so then are you going to rack this up as this being nothing more than, than a celebrity getting a pass? I, I mean, if this was in Canada, they would have enough to charge him here, I think. Right. Um, and they're not doing so. In, so either the law is different there and you know, maybe they can't charge them because the law might be different enough that they just can't. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this interrogation had all the looks of giving them a pass. Um, they Felt just, they really don't ask the tough questions. And so when you compare this one to, I've got a series of videos on uh, Manassian and you can look at how the Manassian interrogation uh, takes place. It's a very, uh, different, uh, different flow to things, right? Uh, Manassian, they start out by letting him tell his story. And then they start in with, but maybe that's not accurate, right? And they start pressing him on these details. And eventually they get the full confession out of him. And even Manassian is, you know, he's a fairly, um, you know, he's a fairly cooperative, uh, you know, subject. Uh, I'll probably do some other ones with people who are less cooperative and you can see sort of what it looks like when they start really pressing somebody, they never get to that here. So they say, uh, even though this involves a gun, wouldn't this be treated like a worksite accident until they find reason to believe there was foul play. Um, I mean, the thing is, is here in Canada, at least there's special rules around guns, mm -hmm. but even a worksite accident can have all sorts of potentially criminal liability to it. Like if you are on the job site fucking around on a, uh, you know, on a forklift and, you know, you are drunk and you're driving it like a crazy person and you spear a coworker with one of the forklift limbs, 
uh, you're probably getting charged criminally, even though it's on the job site. Um, yeah, I see people saying, "Why do you have an armor if the, uh, if the if the talent is responsible? You can have more than one person who's responsible." Um, it's like saying, "Why do you have an air you know an aircraft mechanic if the pilot is responsible for not flying mm -hmm. it into a mountain?" Both people are responsible for making sure that plane doesn't end, you know, halfway up a mountain. I think actually in this instance, you can also uh, add, a, add an element of professionalism and moral obligation. So an armor would be professionally responsible for the safety of that actor. The actor would have a moral obligation to check that firearm because he's a human being holding a gun. Yeah. So it, it is on both sides, but just from different angles. Yeah, I see somebody saying that his reaction to the uh, to learning that she was, uh, you know, dead looked looked, you know, like he was expecting it. I mean, I kind I of figure that has to be think something. So. I, I, I think that's. Think so. I don't. I think he was so cavalier because he didn't think she was dead. He was so loose and and cavalier, thinking that that she was alive and that he was going to skate through this. And when they finally told him that she was dead, it just knocked the wind out of his sails. Well, I think he probably kind of felt like an ass because he was sitting there laughing about things for yeah. however long. Yeah, it's like, mm, dude. Um, yeah, but when he's saying like, you know people were quitting over, you know, this strike stuff. People were leaving because they thought your set was unsafe. Well, you know what? There's a couple of things that he was talking about there. When he was talking about people leaving the set, he started making mention of the fact that they had signed a bad deal so that they could promote business in that region. And he was yeah. saying that he was talking about transportation and, and he's right. Um, when the way it works within the IATSE union, the way it works within, within most of the film unions, whether you're talking about IATSE or NABAT or, the DGC for the uh, Directors Guild or, or ACTRA for the actors, we have uh, distances that we are expected to travel within. And if we're outside of that specific distance from the location, so if it's 30 kilometers or 50 kilometers, whatever the set distance is, we have to be compensated. So what he was saying there was that a lot of the crew was upset because they were having to drive an hour back and forth to get out to the set and they weren't put up in hotels and they weren't being given gas compensation and they signed a bad deal. Uh, in actuality, the truth is, is that when you sign your contract as a, as an employee in a film production, we have no idea where that production is going to be filmed. We have no idea what the locations are. We're not made privy to that information until 24, 48 hours before we're expected to actually be there. We're yeah. provided with a call sheet, uh, around midnight every night. And that call sheet tells us the next day, the location we're going to be at and what it is we're going to be doing. And oftentimes we're not given that location in advance for a lot of reasons. One, we don't want the public to show up. We're trying yeah. to shoot these films in private and we don't want a lot of onlookers uh, Two, a lot of things change. We have to change locations at a minute's notice sometimes. So we don't broadcast or advertise where we're going to be until we know for sure we're going to be there. And that's usually only 24 hours in advance. So to say that this crew was really upset because they signed a bad deal. That's not, that's not fair. Uh, I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that th those guys had no idea that they were going to be that far away from where they were living. And they were disgruntled about it when they found out it was costing them a fortune. And uh, I was tacking on an extra two or three hours of commute every day and they filed a grievance. Uh, I don't blame them. Yeah. So. And somebody was saying in the uh, chat uh, that there's no way you could tell a blank from a, uh, you know, a dummy from a, a live cartridge. It's yes, you can. You can. That's, Absolutely. You can. Yeah. yeah. You know, this is actually not difficult. And uh, you know, the dummies are made to be, you know, discernible as dummies. And blanks are obviously blanks because they they look different. There's no bullet, at, there's no projectile at them. Yeah, at for the people that, for people that don't understand the components of a of a of a round, you've got you know the two very physical components that you can see is that copper colored part that's sticking out the end. That's the bullet, and then the brass casing, and that's what holds the gunpowder. And a blank would be that brass casing that holds the gunpowder without that copper tip. So if you were to put a bullet next to a blank. They are so easily discernible because one is physically larger than the other. One has a giant copper tip sticking out that the other doesn't have. I mean, you can't confuse them. You can't. Yeah. Yeah. There's just no, uh, yeah, there's no way. I mean, you could just look at it and say right away, like this is clearly not, you know, this blank versus a live cartridge. It's so obvious that yeah. this is one of those places that, uh, that sometimes when movies don't do things well, uh, that you just go, oh, 
like I think it was the Hitman movie that they were showing in the trailer where he's, you know, sliding down something and fires mm -hmm. and the brass ejects and you can see that the end is crimped. <laughs> and I was going, oh, yeah. oh, because they do it like a slow pan the, for the movie. I'm thinking they do a slow pan to the, uh, you know, to the casing. And I'm going, right. why would you do a slow pan to what is obviously a flying blank casing so what, what you've got there is a breakdown in departments so yeah. there's only you know when we're recreating these things for film when we're recreating these you know these these shootouts or these car chases or whatever it is that we're doing um we're only able to take it so far right we have limitations as to what we can do and a lot of times it's physics that is our limiting factor but there's going to be small little telltale signs of of our inability to do it for real and and to cheat it and it's up to the guys in the editing department to be aware of that and to be cognizant of that and to watch for those little inconsistencies and to make sure that they don't make it into the final cut. So <laughs> what you're talking about in that scenario is an editor gone bad. Yeah, somebody who was probably told, hey, um, don't, <laughs> yeah, don't do this. And then they did exactly the thing that they shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, it happens. Um, and somebody saying, uh, someone please explain why there were live rounds on the set to begin with. Nobody we can explain. Can't. Yeah, we can't. Uh, this is like saying, why is there cyanide in the kitchen? Yeah. Like, or why is there cyanide in the restaurant? Like, there's just no reason for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah that's, it's... that's the one question that everybody keeps asking. Why were there real rounds on a film set? Why? And nobody has the answer to that. They thought they had the answer. They thought originally the answer was, because the crew was going out after hours and shooting pop cans off of fences, but we haven't actually had anyone come forward to confirm that information. So uh, it takes us right back to the beginning again. And, and we, we don't know. We just don't know. Yeah. And I mean, even that is like such a ridiculous thing. It's like, you know, it's like if somebody said, you know, if you're asking like, Oh, why is this? And it's like, Oh, well, you know, because the crew was, or because people on set were, you know, smoking meth and, you know, yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's such a bizarre thing that somebody would be doing the, uh, you know, would be playing around and firing the guns. In, well, in Canada, it wouldn't happen. I mean, in Canada, it would cost us our license. You know, yeah. that would be the end of it. If, if, if word ever got out that after hours I was taking crew members or talent out behind the studio and letting them shoot pop cans off of a fence, uh, you know, the union would come down on me. The DGC, the Directors Guild of Canada, would come down on me for jeopardizing talent, putting them in harm's way. The police would come down on me, and I'd be charged criminally by local police. The federal police would come down on me, and they would seize my business license and my ability to function within the firearms and film industry. That would disappear. My yeah. firearms collection would be seized, and that yeah. would disappear. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, that in, in this country, what, what they were accused of doing down there couldn't even happen uh well I, i'm not gonna say it couldn't happen it could happen but the repercussions to the people involved would be so severe nobody would do it yeah and i see automata with a uh, super chat here saying why is there cyanide here really big rats uh, <laughs> i mean the other thing is to you know if you lose your business license as a film armor you're going to be stuck with a whole ton of of inventory that you simply can only sell to I don't know what eight other companies in Canada. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so actually on, on our, our business license, we have what's called a, a film and television theatrical business license issued by the CFO. So that license allows us to purchase prohibited class, restricted class and uh, non-restricted class firearms. And it does not allow us to resell. So we are a buy only house. So yeah. we can buy all the firearms we want. We cannot sell in order for us to sell. We have to have a dealer's license, which we're not interested in. So, so we have to buy only. So if for whatever reason something happened and our firearms license was to be revoked, our entire firearms industry, or industry, sorry, our entire firearms inventory would be seized. We would not have the ability to sell it. We would not be financially compensated for the seizure. It would just be, you know, a quarter million dollars disappear. Well, and so. even if you had the ability to, to sell it, um, how many other people like, cause a lot of your stuff is probably going to be full auto or. Yeah. It's all prohibited barrel, class. That's or, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. tons of prohib stuff yeah. is used in films. Cause you know, 
there's a lot more movies about the guy with the machine gun and the that's guy right. with the Uzi than there are about the guy with the bolt action hunting rifle. Right. right? That's right. Yeah. And, you know, at that point, there's how many film armors, you know, there's, there's, a, half, there's a half a dozen of us across the country. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I'm guessing that they're like in Vancouver and Toronto. That's correct. Uh, Vancouver, Toronto. And then I think we've got one in Montreal and there might be one on the East coast. I'm not sure. But so, the majority of us are West Coast and, and Ontario. Even if you could sell it, there would be, you know, not a whole lot of shops that could buy it. And they're not going to, like, they've already got their own supply. So they do. Not to mention, we don't pay retail pricing for firearms. So, uh, you know, the stuff we buy is, is either at wholesale or is bought privately uh, through dealers. So, uh, we, we, you know, even if I was to sell it, I, wouldn't, I would never get what the firearm is worth. Yeah, it's just, it's... So... Yeah, I mean, there's so many things to say. Everybody's got to be super, super careful. And yeah, it's... Uh, people are stunned by what, what's happened. And all of the... This is actually sort of a thing when you look at... Uh, you know, my background is in psychology. And there's sort of people who study the psychology of like industrial accidents and how this ends up happening. And because it's typically not the first mistake that causes the disaster, right? It's typically a situation where you get this kind of cultural complacency where you start getting many, many safety violations and then it explodes when all of those, you know, go off at once. Well, we know about three, you know, negligent discharge infractions that took place on this film set before the accident. So it speaks to your case. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it just, boggles my mind that you could even have one and not like shut down and do a complete audit of how did this happen you know anytime yeah. you've got a bang that should be you know that where you expect it to click uh should be a major like this needs to get sorted because this is you know this is a huge problem there so all right. Well, it is almost midnight where I am. Um, it is probably like 2 a.m. where you are. Um, uh, one fifty-one. Yes, sir. All right. So let's wrap this up here just to, uh, you know, let you get some sleep here. <laughs> thank you. For uh, that. Thank you for, uh, for being willing to, to come on and talk about this. Cause oh, that's uh, my pleasure. This, well, this is such a specialized, um, area of gun safety, right? Because yeah. it's, uh, you know, there's so many things that you might have to do on a film set that you might never otherwise do. Uh, but you make it safe because you do as many of the safety things as you can. And you are super cautious about that. Yes. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, so I see Seth, I, assume they're not referring to you sort of let it slip where the ammo came from he and the armorer's dad had some live ammo made the only question is did seth do it or did he have his girl do it i'm not sure if there was uh was the armorer's i know the armorer's dad was also an armorer that's correct yeah her father's an armorer as well uh and yeah there was some talk about the father having the the ammunition made and some questions around <clears throat> whether the company could have mixed up live ammo with the with the blank ammunition and it could have ended up in the same ammo can. And, and, and there was a lot of conjecture and questions around that. I don't think there's been any clarity since those questions were asked. I don't think there's been any answers to that. Well, the interesting thing will be all the lawsuits because a lot of this information is going to start, um, uh, start coming out with those lawsuits, I think. So, Oh, and I see that the armorer's dad is apparently also named Seth. So that's correct. Seth. Yeah. Different Seth. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, Wow. <laughs> Uh, I was like, oh. but yeah, that's kind of interesting because Seth is not a super common no, name. No, it's not. No, there's very few of us in the industry. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it, it, to find out that there was another Seth uh, involved in this incident was, um, <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah, it's like, oh, why couldn't you have another name? Yeah, any other name, any other name. Yeah, yeah. I, you wouldn't want to get a phone call from somebody who's confused going, I heard a Seth was involved in a, uh, you know, yeah, not. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. No, not good, not good. But, All right. Uh, no, well, I, pre I appreciate you having me on. Thank you for for uh, letting me weigh in on some of this. Oh well, thank you. I I'm I I owe you the debt here, uh, and 
if next time I'm in Toronto, I'll try to uh, look you up and uh, absolutely, see yeah, please out. reach out. I'd love to. I'd love to get together. You're welcome to come by the shop, and uh, and since you're comfortable behind the trigger, we can uh, we can spend some time at the range if you're up for it. I am always up for a range trip. So that'd be great. <laughs> so, that'd be great. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you. And, uh, have a good night. I'll thank just, you, you guys too. Uh, end the broadcast here and. Uh,